What's happening? What's happening? What's happening? Of course, you know it's your boy B-Hop Radio Shouty. And as always, I got my podcast partner off in this thing, OG Gangsta Wicked, the Ghetto Mafia. And today, Wick, mm-hmm. hey man, this is a special day in the A, bro. Man, it's a special day, man. I'm talking about the legend, uh-huh. the man, the, man. the myth, the myth. himself. Yeah. Bun B or UGK, what's good with it, boss? Hey, man, we're going to clear up the myth today. We gonna, <laughs> it's going to be all facts. Come on now. It's all facts. No myths today. I'm with it, you man. You better not start crying in here either, B. I, I, th- I told him, I said, man, boy, that, boy he said you the GOAT. He did, when he found out you was coming, man, I said, B, how you better not get in there and get the crying, man. That's high I, praise. I mean, <laughs> hey, Bun, I got to keep it real, man. So I got to get straight to it then. Because to when it. Wick told me that you was coming down, I did shed a tear. <laughs> because <laughs> Bun B, when it comes to this music, this is what I ride to, man. It done got me through a lot of dark times, happy times, player times, real times in my life, man. And I got to ask you face to face, when it came to you just lacing them tracks and coming with them lyrics, what was it that made you put thought into what you were saying, knowing that your platform would affect millions of young men, especially black men around the world? Well, that's the thing. Like, we didn't come into it like assuming that we was gonna be who we eventually became. Uh, we just wanted to make sure that people understood what type of dudes we were, mm-hmm. that we was real niggas. And so the music was just a reflection of the life we was living, the choices us and different friends around us was making. And it just so happened that people was able to relate to that shit. You yeah. know, the, the background that we come from is we got to travel in the country, you know, like the ghetto boy said, the world is a ghetto. But you don't know that shit when you stuck in your little hood yeah. on your block, you know. You get out, you think the whole everything finna be different. And I leave Houston, I go to Lake Charles and Lafayette and Baton Rouge and New Orleans and Mobile and Birmingham and Jackson. All these places. That's all the goddamn same. Thanks. You know what I'm saying? It look like the same place I eat chicken. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Look like the same liquor store I used to go and get a fill from. Yes, sir. And it looked like the same corners we used to be on. It's just really no different. And once we realized that, we realized, okay, so we don't need to act like anybody else. We don't need to try to do what nobody else is doing. We just do us because most niggas is just like us. Yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And we just kept it simple. I never really overthought it. But at the same time, my job was very easy. Mm. All I had to do was show up and, and, and write a rhyme and spit. Pimp mm. would produce the beat. Pimp did, you know, his verse. And he would be mixing and mastering the album. Sometimes he sang on the hook. So there was a lot more of a commitment in the recording process for Pimp than it was for me. Mm. All I had to do was write a rhyme and spit it. So I was like, well, shit, I need to be cold at that. If that's all I got to do, <laughs> yeah. I need to be damn good at it. So I just focused on being better than anybody they put in front of me. I never knew who was going to be in front of me, though. Mm-hmm. But I just always wanted to be prepared. For you, Bon, what were the lyrics for you that you just felt like you was getting your shit off when you went in that booth, though, man? And when you wrote that stuff down, you were like, okay, if they don't feel this, they just deaf, dumb, and blind. At first, it wasn't even really approached like that. At first, you know, your first record is just for your hood, mm-hmm. right? So you get out there, and all you want to do is talk about the corner stores and the neighborhood and the blocks and the people and the, everything that you see. And then that record connect, and you realize, oh, you got a bigger audience now. You know yeah. what I'm saying? So then you start putting a little bit more attention into what you're doing in terms of presentation, mm-hmm. right? The, the subject don't change. The themes don't change, but... Uh, we, we, we got a lot more people listening and looking at us now. Let's make sure that they see exactly what they're supposed to see. And that's why we never really did a lot of videos because they never gave us a real budget. Mm. So we was like, man, I'm not finna half-ass do no bullshit little video. And these yeah. niggas got two hundred, two hundred fifty thousand dollars $250,000 for a video. <laughs> Y'all won't give me $50,000. That is shit. Yeah. Might as well keep that. Yeah. But at the same time, with that being done, we had to make sure in person that the shit was right. You know what I'm saying? Because people didn't see us on magazine covers and they ain't see us on TV and video. So first time people was going to see us was at the show. Yeah. That's why we used to always get into it with the sound man. <laughs> Come you on. You know what I'm saying? Which you youngsters, you welcome. Yeah. Because as many as sound man got hands put on him, <laughs> you know what I'm saying, in the 90s, so that when y'all came here, it was, it was that was not an issue for y'all. But back then, they used to bring the worst sound system. And, they, you know, sound man, I have more shit. Just wouldn't give it to the rappers. Yeah. You know, and then you have to pull somebody to the side and be like, hey, man, don't play with me with these people. This is my life. This is all I got. Yeah. It better be eight monitors on this motherfucker, and it better be some woofers on this bitch. I'm not finna rap on no house system. <laughs> and I know you got a truck full of shit, and the man paid you. 
Yeah. For the goddamn sound. You pull all that shit out for me. Yeah. You know, Pimp wasn't taking no bullshit with that. The sound, that was the key point of the whole shit. If the sound ain't right, what's the point of doing the show? Facts. For you, though, Bun, when was it that that music bug hit you and you realized that this was something that I wanted to pursue? And when you started, was it something that you felt like you could do for the rest of your life or was it just something you was just kicking no, with the fellas? I, I love the culture. I love the music. And I always wondered, like, where would my place be? Like, am I always going to just be a listener? Yeah. Um, and then people in my city started doing it. Like, mm -hmm. Pimp was a rapper before I was. Mm -hmm. You know, Mr. Boomtown, you know, legendary music video director right. and, and feature film director now. Um, that was my OG. Yeah. Right? He was one of the first brothers rapping my God. in PA, you know. So seeing people that walk your hallways at school and live in your neighborhood rapping, I said, oh, I thought this was just some New York shit. I thought you had to be a certain type of person. Yeah. I'm like, but if this nigga can rap, I know I can rap. Right. Fuck that. So I start, I went for it, you know, and very quickly I became one of the better MCs in town. I just wanted it really, really bad. And then when it came time to actually like try, like actually try to put a record out, motherfuckers didn't really want it. And I looked up and it was really just me and Chad and our DJ Bird. And we used to say, fuck it, we going for it. But I remember watching them and then, you know, rap like you know, came and, and you see the Ghetto Boys, man, that's a game changer for everybody. Yeah. I remember in 91, I was, you know, I had, I, I wasn't going to college. I said I wasn't going to do nothing but this rap shit. My mama put me out. I was at my dad's house. And we shooting pool. It's like 2 o'clock in the morning. And mind playing tricks come on by the Ghetto Boys. And I, I couldn't believe that somebody from, from there made that record. And from that point on, I was like, me and Chad can actually do this shit. Like, we can actually do it, because I think our music sounds just as good. Yeah. And we after that, probably about three months later, we, you know, put Tell Me Something Good on the local radio show. We won the radio show, but they disqualified us because you couldn't be signed, and we was already signed. Uh. But the people still wanted the record. So the radio had to keep playing it. We pressed it up. Tell me something good, and the rest is history. When you look up and y'all started making history, man, when you got into that music <clears throat> industry, was it everything that you thought that it would be, or did it turn out to be a little something wilder than you expected? Oh, man, the day we signed, like, was the best day and the worst day of our life. Shit. You know, we walked in the, the record company, and, you know, we, you know, they got us in the big office, and they, you know, showing us everybody, you know, Houdini and Too Short and all these other different people. That's Tribe Called Quest that signed, and KRS-One. I was a real big KRS-One fan. Yeah. And uh, we signed a deal, and, you know, we and Pimp step out the room to, like, go in the hallway and celebrate, like, nigga, we did it, we did it. And then here come down the hall, here come KRS-One. <laughs> Oh, shit. We like, oh shit, what's up, Carol? Yo, we UGK. You know, we from Texas. We rappers. Yeah. We came up here to sign. That man say, did you sign yet? <laughs> I say, yeah, we just signed. Fuck. Well, man, I wish y'all brothers the best. You know, <laughs> yeah. damn. Right. What the so I'm talking about within two minutes of signing the deal, we felt like, man, we might have just fucked up. And as we got to learn more and more about the contract we signed, we realized we did fuck up. And that's what the man was trying to prevent from happening. Shit. Yeah. Get in here, Wick, because, you know, I, I, yeah, I'll throw I, around. I already know. I mean, I'm like, all right, this nigga, you don't ask another goddamn question. Um, I, I have a question. Was there, uh, one, uh, how did you and Pimp C actually meet before the music? Were y'all childhood friends? We wasn't friends when we met. We had a mutual friend named Mitchell Queen. So Pimp was already rap rapping with Mitchell Queen. I knew Mitchell because we both had, you know, real love for music, and we bonded over music and shit like that. And I ain't really know Chad. Chad didn't know me. We didn't really like each other. Oh, mm. you know what I'm saying? But we didn't know each other. Yeah. And um, I had just come home from from Houston, so my my parents divorced when I was in like elementary. So I would go and stay with my daddy for like any school vacation. I go stay in my daddy's house. But I've been having like a full beard since like me and Mitchell Queen been having a full beard <laughs> since like the tenth grade, right? So we was the niggas that would buy liquor for niggas yeah. and shit like that. <laughs> so I was able to actually get in the eighteen and up club back in the day. So I would come back and be like telling niggas, man, I was in the club and so and so and then was that. So I went in one weekend and Easy E is in the club and it's Easy E D O C and uh, a couple of other brothers and they taking pictures at the Polaroid booth. Right. You know, the man take the picture, put it down, take another picture, put it down. So I stole one of the pictures <laughs> from the DJ booth. So I come back telling the nigga, man, I was at the club with Easy in them. I just seen Easy in the club. <laughs> and, and so I'm telling it to Mitch. 
And Pimp sitting with me. Pimp say, man, you lying, man. You always come around lying <laughs> about this shit, nigga. You ain't seen no motherfucking easy eat. And this, I'm, I say, nigga, I got the picture. <laughs> <laughs> and I say, damn, that nigga did see easy eat. And, <clears throat> and as I got more into music and I started to want to actually like rap, once you decided you wanted to rap, you either was going to be in front of two people making music. That was going to be either Pimp C yeah. or DJ DMD. They made 25 lighters. They were the top two producers in town. Yeah. I had proximity to Chad because of Mitchell, so I eventually ended up in that circle of people. And, you know, I, going in that man's house and seeing him having, like, a beat machine and a four-track and a little keyboard in his bedroom, I thought, man, I was in I thought I was in the biggest studio in the world. I couldn't believe I'd never seen nobody have no shit like that, like, in their house. Yeah, like, we uh, in high school. You know what I'm saying? This uh, man had that shit. I say, this man gonna make some music. And then the next year, he Chad just, he dropped out of school altogether. He was doing homeschool or whatever, but he had made a conscious decision. His junior year, it's my senior year, his junior year, he decided, man, this music or nothing. Yeah. You know? And uh, the more I started doing it, and the more I started like feeling like I was getting better at it, I was like, I think this is what I wanna do too. Now I didn't know if I was gonna make it, but I knew. That nigga was gonna make a record. Right. I was like, Chad gonna make a record. Yeah. I'm gonna stick with Chad. <laughs> yeah, I'm gonna give right. it a year. Right. And see what happened. And I graduated on May 30th, and we signed the Jive Records on May 1st, a year within a year later. I was signed to a record deal. Wow. So I gave it a year, and God said, That's all you need. I got you. Well, I got one more question Come before on I turn it. it back over to the big guy. Over no, there. it's on you, Wick. Uh, and y'all can jump around how y'all yeah, want. Yeah, we gonna jump yeah. around in this to, thing. We don't have exactly. to do chronological exactly. <laughs> right. order. Y'all can jump around and have oh, a well, I'm about time. to be all over the goddamn yeah, place. I got, I got one more for you. Um, but, I, I, you know, I saw you, saw your career, um, you know, from a distance. Right. Um, all the way from b beginning, kind of when y'all signed, until y'all really, really, really blew up. For artists out there that that are grinding, they might have not had a deal. Like shit, get on my feet. Um, y'all had was the hooks, turning, though. What was the turning point for y'all? What, 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 when did you really know I, I don't made it? Because that was like mm. a, a long period of time where y'all were really the underground kings. Right. Then y'all became above ground kings. What, what, what was that turning point? <laughs> That you say, you know what, I, we really, really don't made it now. Well, I mean, look, I came in thinking that once you sign the deal, you made it, right? So go to New York, sign the deal in the room. I figured I made it. Two minutes later, I realized I hadn't done shit, <laughs> yeah. right? And that's kind of, that's par for the course, like, throughout life. You get somewhere, you think, oh, you done did something, and then you look over and motherfuckers over here. I'm like, I ain't done shit. Like, I used to always look at Jermaine Dupree's, like, career arc, mm -hmm. right, and work ethic. Not to count his dollars, but to see like his work ethic and his progress. And so I would always use that as a barometer because we the same age, we come up at the same time yeah. in the same culture. So as long as he here, I'm here. As long as he doing bigger, bigger shit, I need to be doing bigger and bigger shit. So I was always wanting to strive for us to be seen because I always felt UGK was the greatest group ever. I yeah. really felt like nobody could, you, couldn't, you could put me and Chad in the room and that's all you needed. You ain't need no producers, no engineer, none of that shit. Just me and Chad, we gave you the whole album. And so I would put me and him up against anybody. But it took us a while to really, under, like, I ain't know who the publicist was at Direct. I signed in 92. I ain't meet my publicist about 2004. Wow. Right? Never had a promo to him. My record company never put me on the bus. First time I went on the bus, I put that together. You know what I'm saying? Wow. About my first, me and Pimp never had a tour bus. In the entirety of UGK. We were never on nobody tour. Record company never sent us out on promo. We was on in, on planes and in vans. We drove around this motherfucker. You know what I'm saying? Just me and him and our partners just around the country. You know, know. they never they never supported us. They, ain't, they didn't realize we knew what we was talking about until after Pimp came home from prison. Because everything we had been trying to tell them was the shit and that people would connect with, they never believed it. And then as soon as Pimp get locked up and UGK can't make music, here come the whole Houston. With everything we were saying in 95 <laughs> on Riding Dirty right. and 2004, yeah. right. making millions. And they missed all that money. They missed the whole movement. Yeah, You know what I'm saying? And But we, we believed in each other and we believed 
and what we was doing, and we knew the South had our back. So we ain't really worried about nothing else. Mm -hmm. We just did us. Swishers and Doja Bun. That was the, that was the change. My God, that was the change. As to this day, I tell people all the time, y'all have no idea where we was finna go. Like Swishers and Doja, and that was like. That was Pimp, and Pimp has a, had a protege. His name is Steve B. Lowe he in Dallas. He don't really make music no more. Yeah. Because it's, it, it's, like, it's not fun as it used to be when Pimp, Pimp gone. So a lot, of, a lot of us that was really, really heavy with if you notice, there's like four, five years where I ain't making no music. Yeah. Because it just wasn't fun without him no more. But that was Steve and, and Chad were creating this new Southern sound, like the rap version of Southern rock. My God. So to speak. You know what I'm saying? Very you, very guitar driven, but still four beat. So it still had that rap feel. And Switchers and Doja was this whole new direction that we was going in. Now there's a lot of traditional music on that album, mm -hmm. but Switchers and Doja by far, it that was the, that was where we were headed. A whole new way. And the boy was always ahead of the game. Yeah. People still can't make a, a song like that to this day. Step your game up, build your name up, quit your talking and get to doing. All that planning and contemplating, when the fuck you gonna start pursuing those bars right there, bud? Cars Don't. ain't driving they sell. Come on, man, just ain't, ain't buying they sell. Come on, man. I mean. They I waiting for Ed, Megan, Ed McMahon, which might have been over these youngsters' head. Come on. Because, you know, Ed McMahon used to come with that publisher's clearinghouse <laughs> and knock on your door and bring you the... Bringing yeah. them seven figures. <laughs> but Boy. if you're waiting for that, man, you you need to stop feeling yourself. Ain't nobody finna bring you shit. Nobody's finna give you nothing. You couldn't be in a better position than me and Chad was in. And we still had to fight and grind. Talent proven, connection with the people proven, records stole, sold, and we still got to prove ourselves. So if I'm 20 years in this bitch still trying to let niggas know, and look, I'm not taking off my shirt in the middle of the street beating on my chest. <laughs> Right? Yeah. But I still will get in these rap trenches with these young niggas and give them some balls. Facts. You know, just, just so everybody understand. But did you understand that those balls were pivotal in people's lives? Because when I'm in this industry as a young man trying to figure out why ain't I am out in the shit, and then I listen to Swishes and Doja. And see, that's the thing about it. You got timeless music as well. So it might have meant something to me when it first came out, but then it meant something different to me when I listened to it again. So when I realized I wasn't going nowhere, I said, well, boy, I said, step your game up and build your name up and quit your talking to get to doing. And that's what I did. I literally took that advice from them bars and applied it to my regular life, man. But we learned from a lot of people. Uh -huh. We learned from Too Short, right? That Not just through the music, but literally personally. We were doing the show in Cleveland, Ohio. It was outside, and niggas started shooting and fighting in the crowd. And we on the stage. So we supposed to get on stage. Short said, man, you don't get on stage like Keep doing the music, because if you get to fight the attention, that's where the people attention going to be. Yeah. But if you stay on stage and keep rapping, people going to stop giving a fuck about the fight. So we went back up, we kept, and I've used it to manage violence in concerts Damn. for years. You know, because it'd, be, it'd always be somebody ignorant doing something ignorant. And the niggas gonna fight and gonna do what they want. Man, look at these dumb ass niggas. Anyway, fuck that shit. We, the show up here, my nigga. You know, <laughs> exactly. security gonna, gonna do what they got to do, escort it or not. You know, people didn't really used to shoot up the whole club because they got beat up back then. Yeah. Or, but it, times have changed. So, it, they, you know, it's, it's a little different. But, you know, we used to, and we used to be in the hood as a hood. Yeah. Right? We used to be in the wildest of places. You know, I just left Decatur and I was just thinking about all them times at the gate. Yeah. yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying. Yeah. That, was a bunch to live. that was a yeah. real parking lot, man. Yeah. My I'm God, give a fuck if you was from the Cape. That was a real <laughs> parking lot. Facts, you know. But look, man, we always kept it 100 with people, and we ain't never come in nobody's city disrespecting nobody and acting like we was harder than nobody. We kept it real with people. We saw the world a certain way. We spoke on it. Niggas felt it, and when we came in the hoods, man, niggas would. Open their own. I remember we went to Louisiana, a real small town. We pull up and promote the checkers in the hotel. And then he come to me, hand me a bag of dope. I say, what you want me to do with this? <laughs> so I thought maybe y'all want to go to cuts and, you know. Hang out. Yeah. I said, not out of town, my nigga. I don't. <laughs> he, literally, he literally gave me, like, I think it was probably maybe two eight balls and a couple of slats. <laughs> yeah, right. And, like, just thought I wanted to go and catch me a good case. <laughs> real quick. Riding Dirty Bond. That album right there, man, I mean, 
probably one of the best hip hop albums of all time as well. What was it like when you and the pimp got together and made that one? That one was different because that was the first time that the record company was like, do what y'all do. Because we didn't want no upfront money. Mm. We just wanted equipment and time. Yeah. Right? So we was like, we don't want no bunch of money. Just give us creative control. Mm Y'all can keep the money. If just give us some equipment to record in and just leave us alone and let because they would I mean it on too on too hard to swallow. There's songs where they literally went in and changed the beat, reproduced the song Damn. Mm. without telling us, and then put it on the album and it should just just a whole new beat. You know, didn't approve it or anything. You I, just, my contract you know. did not give me the power <laughs> to approve. So when you See, you hit it for the first time I, the when they send me out. the motherfucking album on the weekend before it come out and they send me the album out here. Then you hear. Wow. High Life Bun. Who gives a damn if you can't afford the turkey and ham living off of Raymond Noodles, <laughs> beef jerky, <laughs> and spam? Now, see, when you talk about the, talking to people through music, yeah. right, this is the album where we figured it out. Uh, right? That's why you have records like One Day, yeah. which was, you know, one. so One Day was originally Three Two's record. Yeah. It was for Three Two's album. Three Two comes over. Plays us the whole album and said, well, I'm probably not going to use one day. Pimp looked at him like, you crazy, nigga. That's the best record you got. That's the hit. Yeah. Like, man, that shit too slow. People ain't always like, give it to me. <laughs> give it to me. <laughs> I'll show you it's a hit. That's why 3 2 is the first verse. Yeah. Right. On the record. But that was his record produced by Big Boss. Rest in peace to him and 3 2. And, you know, just this vision that the boy had, he knew exactly how we. He knew exactly how the streets needed to be talked to mm. at the time. And High Life is that one. High Life is the one like, look, man, this life is fucked up. It's not easy. My mama be tripping. My grandmama be tripping. I know your tea lady tripping, too. Yeah. I know it's it's not easy doing certain shit. You get to worry because we, we all raised in the church, right? We making these choices. And it's one thing if you go to jail or not, but this is a whole different thing if you believe you might go to hell for the Woo. choices that you make, you know, and that's why that's when you start hearing people, you know, is there heaven for a G yeah. and shit like that? Because this is real, yep. right? We understand the difference between good and bad, right and wrong, you know what I'm saying, heaven and hell. And you got to take all that shit into consideration when you out here doing this stuff. But they tell you that, you know, if you repent for your sins, God will grant you in- entry. We doing a lot of shit where we don't know if we going to have time to repent. Mm-hmm. You know, if you get shot in the stomach, maybe, right? But you yeah. get shot in the head, you ain't. You repent. You you ain't got time. Yeah. You know, and and but we still make dealing with these choices. And just because I do it tonight, don't mean I'm not gonna do it tomorrow. So it, it's a lot that young brothers in the street was dealing with, and we just tried to give it like a voice mm-hmm. and talk to people. We realized based on certain songs we had made before, people come back man, see that that man. You made that man, and we heard that man. I'm talking about man. So it's like okay, well, if niggas hear this and want to go this way. Niggas might need to hear this and go this way. And Jay Prince was always big about talking about God on records. Mm. You know what I'm saying? Honoring God. If you look at all the Ghetto Boys records, there's always something where they're honoring God. You yeah. know, he's always, look, man. Uh, I remember my pastor told me a long time ago, you got to make sure, for what you're doing, young man, you better make sure to take God with you because he might not be where you're going. Wow. Man. You know what I'm saying? Because we in the gutters. I had to explain to my partner the other day. My partner like, man, you know, he came home and, he making music again, but he's got other businesses, and he's doing good for himself. I'm like, why would you want to rap, my nigga? I said, for the last 30 years, I've been getting paid at 2 in the morning with pistols in the room. Wow. Come on. That's what I do for a living. Not all that shit y'all see, the videos and in the club popping bottles. My nigga, I get paid at 2 in the morning with pistols in the room yep. every time. Wow. Yeah. You know, that's, that's, how I, that's how I go to work. You know, so do you really want that? Because that's what you signing up for. <laughs> right. I feel you. <laughs> I feel you. Bun, uh, I want to ask you about the biggest record <laughs> on the east side. Come on that with we it. ever yes. loved from UGK. It was something you had called Pocket Full of Stown. Oh. Right on. To this day. It, to this day, it's like it's like to this day. <laughs> if, you, if, if you play that record right now in the club, I'm talking about the kid, the new generation know it, the older generation. What in the hell? How did y'all come up with that, Brad? This was a record that really was. So we riding around, or we in my car. I'm with my partner, Big Rob. We picking up his little brother, rest in peace. And um, we listening to the Pete Rock and CL Smooth album in the car, which of course. 
Pimp is not a big fan of all East Coast music, <laughs> but he did have a lot of respect for the producers. Mm -hmm. So he did like Pete Rock as a producer. Um, not necessarily listening for the lyrics, just trying to hear the, the beats or whatever. So my partner get in the car, and he's like, man, hurry up, man. We got to get out. I got a pocket full of stones. And while he say that, there's literally, there's, there's an interlude. So if you go and listen to the first Pete Rock and CL Smooth album, there's interludes between every song. Mm -hmm. Like there's the song they do, and then there's just a sample. And then a song and a sample. And it's literally the sample for Pocket Full of Stones comes from the Pete Rock and CL Smooth album. Wow. At that time, and he literally starts saying, I got a pocket full of stones. Oh. <laughs> and we're like, Pee Wee, what, what song, what, beat, what track is that? And so, you know, this... Now I got to pull out this way back. I got to pull out back then. So I hit the little button to go back. And so I think it was track three. And he's like, I got to remember that shit. And he went back and made the beat, put the hook on it. The rest is history. The but man then was they genius, wound up man. on Menace to Society as well, though, man. Because Jive Coast. was doing the con the, the Jive did the soundtrack. And, uh. they, and this is the first time, like, before Menace to Society, the majority of movie soundtracks was typically one artist uh. did the whole soundtrack. You know what I'm saying? They bring one person in, and they would make all the music for the movie. Job, because they had all these different artists at the time, wanted to put all their artists and, you know, get their talent out there. So they just used it as a free album to promote their roster. You know, and so we went in, and we made a song called 93 Mac um, for the movie. Um, but it had a sample in it, and they didn't want to clear it because mm. it had a sample. It was a Curtis Mayfield sample. Um, and they was like, do y'all have anything else? And while we was there, Pip was fucking around and had made a Pockets remix mm. while we was there. And he was like, well, shit, we got this, you know? So we gave him the Pockets remix. And originally, they wanted Pocket Full of Stones in the movie where, when, when Kane first cooked dope, ah, right, 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 they right. wanted it there. <laughs> um, but it didn't, wow. for some reason, because the first song got turned down, it didn't clear for that scene. So if you went to Damn. the movies and saw Minister Society, you heard Dope Man. Yeah. But if you watch yep. it on cable now <laughs> or see it on TV, right. you're gonna hear Pocket Full of Stones. Oh my God. Wow. Murder Bond. That song, when you heard that track, what the hell was going through your mind? Because that's the most vicious, hard snapping verse that anybody's ever heard in their damn life. <laughs> and you look at that, you look at that wicked on purpose when you yeah, say Yeah, I'm letting them know yeah, it. Yeah, this, this it don't get man. no harder than that. <laughs> you snap. I can't say that it's the hardest verse ever, but I will say that there's a shift in Southern rap from that moment on. Mm. Right? Because for years, a lot of UGK music is very slow and easy and ride music. But I come in as a battle rapper. I'm a rapper. Like, I'm an MC. I'm a lyricist. I want to spit. Everything this nigga make is so goddamn slow, I can't really <laughs> right, spit right. like I want to. And, and But at the same time, be telling her, Bum, be the best rapper. Can't no nigga I rap him. I got 100,000 on everybody. <laughs> you know, I'm like, well, let me show niggas. So this yeah. was the one. You know, like, this and, um, the beat, Pee Wee. Mm -hmm. This the one that was that was his nickname for me was Pee Wee, and um, this the one. Go ahead, do do your thing. This the one. And I come in kind of like you, you know, had a rough night, <laughs> big long <laughs> night, you know, what? full of that liquor. Yeah, <laughs> and um, you know, I, I go in the studio and they playing the beat. So while they tracking the beat out, which this is still in a still somewhat analog time. Riding Dirty is one of the first. Riding Dirty is recorded in Pro Tools in the beta version. Mm. So a lot of people don't know Ryan Dirty is one of the first albums, not rap albums, one of the first albums to be recorded in Pro Tool. My God. So I'm literally one of the first rappers given the opportunity to punch in. Ooh. Wow. On the Ooh. verse. Wow. And I refuse to. Ooh. Because my thing is, whatever I do in this booth, I got to be able to do on stage. <laughs> so I refuse to punch in <laughs> on murder. So what you hear is the second take. Ooh. I did it once. I got through. I was like, I think I can do it better. I did it again. And Pip said, that's it. We're not doing this on no more. That's it. And I was asleep. So when they was tracking it out, like, you know, big long ass boys, them old school boys, mm -hmm. I was, I went under that hole and went to sleep. But I was still hung all <laughs> fucked up. <laughs> My verse was already wrote. And they woke me up. Pee Wee, go do your verse. Yeah. I do the verse. Two takes. 
I go back and sleep. And I don't, at the time, it's the hardest verse I ever wrote. I'm not sure if I had heard any verse that I could say was harder than that at the time, mm -hmm. but I never would have thought it would have still be looked at today. But what I will say is that after that verse, it was a lot easier for a Southern artist to present himself as a lyricist, mm. right? Without having to sound like you from New York. Yeah. Because that was the whole thing, right? For years, we thought you had to sound like you was from New York yeah. to make rap music. Rap a lot records and the Ghetto Boys changed that perception mm -hmm. for us, right? So we reveled in our Southerness. You know what I'm saying? You can look at Pimp. That was one thing. He's like, they ain't going to never mistake me for a nigga from nowhere else but the side for no my mouth. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? And, you know, to this day, people, rappers, lyricists still come up to me. The first, that was the first time somebody that I looked up to said you could rap was with murder. I met Biz Market. Biz Market, rest in peace. Was, this was in the D DJ phase when he started transitioning in the DJ. And I, met, I was like, hey, man, my name is Bum B. You know, and I come to people humbly. Mm -hmm, you know what right. I'm saying? I don't expect motherfuckers to know who I am. You know, yeah. it's Biz Market, he's a legend. He's like, Bum B, murder rap. I know you. <laughs> <laughs> I said, okay, so now, so, but at this point, now I know you niggas can't deny me. I know if he know, y'all know. Come on now. So now you're not finna deny who I am in no room. So I'm walking, I used to walk in rooms humble, but ready to go. Now yeah. I'm walking in with my nuts hanging. I know you niggas know I can go. Exactly. So let's do it. But everybody open, welcome me with open arms. I never had, that was the funniest thing, man. I walked through this whole shit, man. <laughs> waiting for it. Waiting for it. <laughs> and never got in. I thank God. You know what I'm saying? I never, I just knew at some point somebody was going to want to test me and try me, and it never happened. And I'm so glad because it never looked right. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Nowadays, rappers beef, it's not really even about rap. It's about some other shit, mm -hmm. you know? But my whole thing was two rappers don't like each other. Y'all can rap about it or y'all can box it out. That's really the only options. You know what I'm saying? That's the only way to, to level the playing field because everybody got guns. Mm -hmm. Right, so we can Thanks. all bring guns, right? Yep. We can all bring some rhymes, but we got to get down man to man, one to one. We gonna figure it out. But a fight was always just that, just a fight. Yeah, that shit never really went further than that. Two niggas box it out, dap up. And a lot of times, Bone, you from that generation, you get into it with a nigga you ain't like him for a long time. Once you box with him, that'd be your partner. You can respect that nigga. Yeah, you realize niggas around you scared. At least that nigga's called a square. Exactly. Right. Like, you bitch-ass niggas been around here some hoes the whole time. <laughs> some whole hoes, yeah. Some, a whole ho the whole time. <laughs> and it's a lot of niggas bluffing. Yeah. You'd be surprised how many niggas walking around here ain't never been punched in the mouth. Yeah. And they never had to punch a nigga before. Yeah. It's a lot of niggas bluffing. Yeah, I, mean, I said that a lot of times. I was talking to one of my partners about that. He was like, man, I ain't... I ain't never lost a fight. I said, well, you must not have been fighting. <laughs> yeah. I got my head out, all these scars. You and must stuff have about two. Head. Yeah. Your you know little brother saying? don't count either. Is it? <laughs> yeah, man. I said, you must ain't been in no fights, bro. You you know, because. Yeah, I don't know nobody that ain't never took an L. Not if you it, you catch a square, you're going to take it. Exactly. It's how you take it, though. Exactly. It's always about how you take it. Ain't nothing wrong with losing a fight. It's how you take a loss. Absolutely. And that's in life. That's how you take any loss. Another time that Bun came in and Rose Hill was on that grand finale with Lil John, man. So, talk to me. That verse is off time. Mm. It's not mixed right. John didn't mix it right. No, no, I think Mike <laughs> Dean mixed that record. Oh, okay. okay. <laughs> Mike <laughs> Dean mixed that record, okay. and I kept trying to get Mike Dean to get the timing right. I kept telling him you're not coming in on the right because I come in early off the beat and I end early. So if you notice, it go from me to Nas, and it's like a little protracted yeah. little thing where they had to kind of stretch Nas's verse out because I'm literally two beats off. And that be still jam, which is crazy. I didn't no, catch it, bud. Yeah, I didn't you, catch it. You would have never knew if you didn't tell nobody that. No, it, it still it, works. It, feel like you it, it still though. works, but I wrapped it with, with extra ending. So each verse uh, had extra ending. Yeah. But this, when they the way they did it, it came in early, so each verse ended on time. He's bought in it on time. <laughs> and that happened twice. I'm trying to remember the other rack. I can't think of the other rack, but that's the one. And I was mad because I knew Nas and Wayne. I knew all these niggas was on this rack. Yeah. I was like, man, bro, that what you did? <laughs> <laughs> that what you did? You but, still showed up on that thing, yeah, though, you can't bro. really get mad at Mike Dean. Mike Dean ain't got a bad bone in his body. He, yeah. You know, he 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 he, he apologized profusely, as yeah. they say. <laughs> you know. 
because his whole life is mixed, and he just you know he hated that he got that wrong. Yeah, but <clears throat> there was a lot of communication through third parties. Yeah, I wasn't talking to him direct. You know mm-hmm. what I'm saying? Every time they send me back the record, I'd be like, it's not. It's not right. It's not right. Yeah. And I just gave up. And the cold shit is, I did a record with Gigs from London about three years ago and did the same thing to him. <laughs> did the same thing to him. He kept telling me, oh, gee, it's not, oh, it's not right. It's not right. Oh, gee. It's not right, man. And I was like, all right, we're going to get it right. And I, and I was like, okay, I think we got it. But I think the version we sent in the master wasn't that he, and he, he yo, thanks again, OG. Still wrong, though. I'm like, <laughs> <laughs> so, now here's another thing. So, within the last year, I did a record with Larry June. Mm. Larry June out the bay. Yeah. Larry June rap off beat on, pers- uh, on purpose. purpose. Okay. So, he's on the record that I, this record I got with Corey Moe. And Corey oh, Moe, wow. like, I mixed the record and sent it back. They said it's wrong. I said, man, y'all wrong because the nigga off time. I say, Corey, you ain't, because Corey had never listened. I said, you got to listen to him, Corey. He rapped like offbeat a little on purpose. Yeah, right. So, really, so you want me to mix the verse like that? <laughs> say, yeah, that's how you want it. That's how you want yeah. it. Yeah. But Wait, yeah, no, that was, that was a master though. at that. Silk the Shocker. I don't think Silk was doing it on purpose, though. I, 40 does it you on know, purpose. You know, can, can I say something about Silk, man? Because I see people give Silk hell. Hell. <clears throat> Y'all realize the first time y'all heard Silk the Shocker, but that was the first rhyme that man had ever wrote and had to go in the studio and say that shit on record with people who had been rapping for years. My that God. man had to work all that shit out in front of us in real time. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. I never knocked it because if my first rhyme would have came out, I wouldn't be in this chair right now. Nah, I right. feel you. Right. Niggas been like, oh, that's trash. Get his ass up. I this hoe. Well, see, Silk, he still snapped on that. Uh, no, he figured it out. Yeah, he, he snapped figured now. it out. Yeah, yeah, he was But snapping. he was working all that shit out in real time. But answer me this, though, Bun. You went over there to No Limit and Rose Hell, too, man. Oh, yeah, no. We... I mean, songs like Meal Ticket, You, Pimp, P, and 8 Ball, and MJG, man. I think the one is slanging. Slanging. That's the one. That's how you feel. That's the one. Now, a lot of them records might have been bigger, but Fiend was always a very capable rapper. Fiend is a beast. Right? So, doing a song with Fiend is a lot different doing yeah. these other records. Fiend can actually really fucking rap. Yeah. Especially at the time. The nigga was on the tap yeah. at that time. So, I, I knew I had to come with it on that Woo. one. But, at the same, you know, Beast by the Power was making some of the coldest beats, period, <laughs> at the time. So for me, it was fun just, you know, rapping with them. And then same thing with Manny, with Cash Money. Yeah. You know, Manny was really in a zone in those first couple of years, man. I mean, they eventually started making it, you know, music, you know, more for more people. But, man, them early years when they was just making records for New Orleans, yeah. man, Manny was a fool, fool with it. What was it like for you, though, being able to jam with Beats by the Pound? You got some other production outside the pimp and then no Joe, and these boys are going crazy, and they in a zone at the time. Well, I mean, Moby Dick and KL are like, you know, they, those are brothers. Yeah. You know, those are brothers of ours, you know, particularly Dick, because, you know, Dick would come to the house and just be there with us for, for days, like making music, you know, and just hanging out. You know, you know him and Pimp had a very, very close relationship because yeah. they both made beats. But they both were singing, so they yeah. drew, they drew their cues from different places. So yeah. they they were so good at redoing these R and B records because the niggas was R they were R and B artists like Moby yeah. D. Moby Dick could have very well went off and been his own recording artist. Pimp Thanks. had always wanted to at some point do a blues band. That was uh, that was his thing. Wow. C L Butler and. Uh, <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Wow. Was, and so he had always wanted to do a blues band. So these they had a very high IQ when it came to music and that's why they was able to do what it was they did but I mean just being around I mean so these are some of my best friends you know having Moby Dick and KLC and Manny Fresh in your phone yeah. right and not even feeling like you need them cause you got Pimp yeah. sitting next to you you know my God. I had all this ammunition at the palm of my hands and didn't even realize the kind of power I was sitting on until I had to start doing solo records what was that energy like, though, when y'all boys got together and it was going down, man? Because I can only imagine what the fuck the energy was like it, in there. It was crazy because a lot of these records were literally done at, like, 3 in the morning. So we would be in Baton Rouge for a show. P would know we coming. Mm-hmm. They constantly working mm-hmm. in the office, right? Because at this point, it's a factory, mm-hmm. right? They working on four, five, six different albums at one time. 
And so, you know, hey, man, y'all y'all know y'all here. Y'all come over to the studio and do a record. Mm-hmm. And then we go over, and this week is Fiend, and this week is See Murder, you know. <laughs> the one time I didn't go, um, I was supposed to be on Miss My Homies. Wow. And I was tired. I was like, man, I don't now feel like going to the studio. I was like, I, was supposed, I was saying, man, I'm tell person, man, I, I'm tired, man. I just, I can't do it. I, just, I don't want to go. It had been alone. And because you know what I'm saying? I used to do all the driving. Yeah. For UGK. So no matter where we went for a show, I drove us. You know what I'm saying? Checked us in the hotels. We went to sound check, made sure people got fed. Did the show, and because we have a bunch of people with us, and some of these niggas used to be real loose <laughs> and wild, I had to make sure everybody get in the room and locked face. in. Yeah. And we ain't getting robbed, because this is where they used to really rob rappers, y'all. Yeah. They, we, we don't really talk about this a lot, but, you know, we, we didn't start in House of Blues. Yeah. You know, it took years for, for my generation to get those kind of shows. The majority of the people that threw our shows were either old school club owners that had been in that market for 20, 30 years, or drug dealers cleaning up money. That was mm-hmm. it. There was no middle ground. Yep. And drug dealers are not promoters by cho- by nature. It's by choice. Mm-hmm. So just because they think they booked a certain person at a certain venue that everybody's supposed to come in, mm-hmm. but they don't know how to promote, they don't know how to do the spots, how to hit the city with the flyers. So show day coming, them niggas don't make their money. I've seen niggas take money back from people before. Wow. Like in the room, you know? Oh my God. Wow. This shit was real, and this shit happened, I won't say often, but it happened enough for, yeah. for, for niggas to just start moving different. And that's why we preferred to drive yeah. over flying. Because if I drive, get the hell out of you here. Know, no, you know what I'm bringing, and oh, you know what's coming oh, with me. Oh, I ain't mad at that. Yeah, if I'm on the plane, I, you know, that's different. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> okay, the 90s born, the golden era of hip hop. The South still had something to say. What was that like when you seeing Biggie and Tupac doing their thing during that time and all of the focus is on them, but y'all still raising hell in y'all own right? Well, that's because the South didn't really know the power we had. Mm. It took a while for people to really, and if you look at it, it's, just, it's easily geographical, but it took a while for us to realize that there was more of us than anywhere else. Thanks. Mm. Right? But because all the magazines are in New York and all the... TV outlets are in California. That's all you really would see mm-hmm. was New York and L.A. And we didn't understand. And we were still trying to figure out how to go from local to mainstream. And this is all happening everywhere. So Houston is doing it here. Oakland is doing it here. New Orleans is doing it here. Atlanta is doing it. Miami is doing it, right? Yeah. And the more we travel and the more we go to these different places, we realize, man, like, wait a minute. Texas, Louisiana, Alabama, Mississippi. Florida, Georgia. Wait a minute. <laughs> New York is just New York, New Jersey, yeah. Connecticut, yeah. and when they feel like saying it, Philadelphia. <laughs> right? New York be acting real funny with Philadelphia. Yeah. They're right there. Yeah. You know? And the West Coast is, you know, it's California, yeah. Nevada, yeah. maybe a little Seattle, you mm-hmm. know, whatever. Right. But the South, we the South. Come on. Right? And so it, it hits us all collectively. We don't need to sell records nowhere else. If we do sell records to other places, that's, that's cool. cool. I'll yeah, run yeah. with it. But we really don't need to sell records nowhere else but here. And we don't need to do shows nowhere else oh, but here. Facts. So everybody I know who was rapping <clears throat> from the South at the time, as long as them niggas wasn't scared to get in the van and take that ride, niggas was getting bags. You know? Yeah, now, on. Now, these bags are different, mm. right? Generation before me, they got paid in like a sandwich bag, <laughs> right? My generation got paid in grocery bags. Yeah, yeah. This generation getting paid in trash bags. <laughs> <laughs> That's true. <laughs> but it's all proportional because yeah. the people that came before me looked at me like, damn, look all the money these niggas get. Yeah, uh, yeah. You know, yeah. so that's why I don't look at these young niggas like they're getting that big money, but shit, that that what you making is. And it I, it goes as far as what I made back then. Yeah. It's all proportional, but they 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 do get to benefit differently because for us to make money, you had to actually sell a physical record in the store. Mm-hmm. That right. was it, right? And if your publishing deal was good and you got some radio play, which Southern artists didn't really get that national, we didn't get in the national system. You can make some bread, but now you don't even need a whole album. You put out one song. You go on eight different streaming platforms, the video on YouTube. You can get on a movie trailer, a TV show, some stream. It's, it's 10, 12 different revenue streams. 
yeah. that you got just from one record. Right. That's why people don't really concentrate on albums. They get one, two, three songs that's streaming good. The album's really redundant at this point. Right. Yeah. Right, yeah. just dropping singles out there. Yeah, yeah, hell yeah. And I'm not mad at them. I'm glad that it changed because I know how the, the, the old school to my generation fought for us to eat. And I know how my generation fought for them to eat. They supposed to be rich. That means we did it right. That means we gave them the right game. Yeah. That means we opened up the lanes well, and showed people, hey, you can get money like these white people get money too. Do you too. feel like they they you know they reciprocate that love back to us? They do. I, I mean, I don't have a problem. I, but I open my arms to young people. A lot of niggas from my generation didn't do that. A lot of people got jealous, concerned about holding on to their spot. They didn't embrace the next generation. Gotcha. I didn't have no problem with the next generation because for one, I knew you niggas couldn't rap better than me, so you're not really a threat, <laughs> right? In that sense. But if I put Young niggas are, if I pick the right team, right? It's not just about, you know, niggas will rap with whoever got money. You got to yeah. look at the team around them because you'll be putting the wrong niggas in the game and then you'll turn around and want to complain about the game. You co-sign that nigga. You know what I'm saying? So you got to be as good a judge of character as you can. Co-sign the right people who not only will come back for you, but will come back for other people as well. Right. You know, and I was able to do that. Getting in with cash money with a person like Wayne very yeah. early. Wayne went out, did his thing, became a great rapper, still one of the greatest rappers working right now, arguably the greatest rapper alive. Put other people on. Told you. Everything I Hold up. I, well, see, I, now, I was just I about to agree that. with you on something that you just said, said because I'm about to go down arguably, the rabbit hole with Bud right now. Arguably. I said, I said you can make a case for a lot of different you know what, LL, we, Wayne. That, that, that's, no, that's, not, that's not a stretch. I'm going to let you have that one right now with because the boys in here. I'm going to let you have it because the boys in here. I just want to sit back. To, 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 uh, to, you know, let you hear that what he just said. Well, no, nah, I'm going to argue with But see, okay, then. Well, see, I'm going to take it all the way down. I'm about to bring a full circle on Bun and on you. Why is Wayne one of the arguably the greatest rappers of all time? Because it's yeah. with his body of work, but I'm gonna let Bun. No, let me get in there. Already, because I'm, he had Bun be as a mentor early on when they brought him in to help them boys learn how to he, rap. He, talk about that, Bun. I can't Bun. take that kind of credit. I, I know you don't want to take that kind of credit, but you showed at, up. At, 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 at the least, I, I would say I did help with the work ethic, right? Mm -hmm. Because Baby knew he had an extremely talented artist in Wayne. Mm -hmm. And his whole thing was I, I gotta cultivate this talent, I gotta put this talent in the position to grow and be as good as, cause we looking at him at 14 when he can't curse and he's easily the best rapper in the room. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. so at, at, and at 14, I'm serious. Yeah. At 14, he's easily the best <laughs> rapper in the room. And it's like, and he's not cursing, but you get the gangster tone from the verse without him even have to curse. I say, when the nigga learn how, when the nigga's allowed to curse, <laughs> it's gonna be a the problem. It's gonna be a problem, Yeah, you know? So Stunner was like, how do we nurture this talent? Uh, my whole thing was just keep him in the studio. Mm -hmm. Whatever it is he want to do, let him do it in the studio. Mm -hmm. So that when he try to do it away from the studio, it feel different. It feel weird. It's foreign. It's a foreign environment. He want to hang with his partners, let them niggas come hang in the studio. But they got to rap too. Mm. They ain't got to be good, but they got to rap too. Rap mm -hmm. too. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Because yeah. if they not rapping, they're going to take his mind off rapping and want to go somewhere else. All right? Wow. If he wants some little girls to come by, meet him at the studio. Yeah, they want to play Madden and video games, meet them at the studio. He get old enough, they want to smoke weed, do all that shit, smoke it at the studio. Now the studio is a safe space. Mm. You feel protected in the studio. You go out in the world, outside the walls, you don't feel the same. Mm -hmm. Go right back. Now, I would argue that's probably one of the skate, probably where you go skateboarding in the studio are two of the most comfortable places in his life. And yeah. home now. Yeah. And home. So now... What Wick had said earlier, I got to piggyback off that because we got to go down a whole rabbit hole with that thing. When it comes to Bun B co-signing new artists, mm -hmm. I mean, you got folks like Drake and Jeezy. When you first heard Drake, what was going through your mind when they said, Bun, we need you to come in this thing and jam with Drake? I was tired, and mm. I almost didn't do it. What? I almost didn't do it. I had been in the studio all day because I go in the studio typically about 10 in the morning. Uh -huh. I'm not a night owl. I, yeah. like, I like to be five o'clock traffic home. So I go in the studio <laughs> early as hell and work all day. Mm -hmm. So it's about four o'clock. I live an hour away from the studio I'm in. Mm -hmm. Trying to get out that hole so I can miss five o'clock traffic. Thanks. Right, because I got to go through downtown to get home. Jazz Prince, who found Drake and brought him to Wayne, called me. 
He had been asking me for the long, for about probably about two weeks, Unc, I need you on something. I need you on something. I got you. No problem. I got you. And I did have him. On that day, he called me three different times. Unc, I need you on this record. Okay, Unc, Unc, we turned it in tomorrow. And I'm literally packing up everything, getting my keys, and the phone rang again. <laughs> he didn't got me. I, I looked at him as jazz. I'm finna do it right now, nephew. Because the man, I've been knowing him for years. The man never asked me for nothing in his life. Yeah. Not like he needed to. He's Jazz Prince. He's Jane's son. <laughs> yeah. You don't need nothing. But, it, but it was the first time he had ever asked me for anything. And he was on that time crunch. And I said, let me do it. And I did it. And I was like, it's a cool little record, you know. About a week later, it come out. The album come out, you know. Making a little noise on the album. He got Trey songs on there. I was like, I ain't know all this shit was going on. <laughs> <laughs> he go do the first show. He do a show. It's a college show in New York. And all these girls show up at this show. It was on YouTube. It was, on YouTube. It was a big deal. And they're all singing all the words to all the songs Ooh. at his first show. First show. Second show is Atlanta. The Atlanta girls are watching the New York girls from the first show. Mm -hmm. right. They come more women singing more songs loud everywhere. Third show is Houston. Now it's like, okay, this momentum is growing. Right. I was like, I got to go to this show. At first, I didn't know if I was even going to go. That's why you hear him on the song, Backstage at Warehouse Live, like it's bun coming. Right. Yeah. But I was like, you know what? So I showed my wife the videos because she had heard the song. She, you know, she wasn't necessarily <laughs> impressed by the song, whatever. I showed her these videos and I tell her about it. She's like, let me go see this. So she invited two of her friends and it's literally a sea of women. Mm. Chameleon ass there because Chameleon ass trying to figure out who is this kid that sings <laughs> That's singing that's got all this momentum. Come in that's always one step ahead. Right. Smart, one of the smartest people hip hop ever had the luxury of being a part of the culture. Seriously. Yeah. And we get there and my wife is my wife and ESG's wife and my friend Bandit's soon to be wife. They're all in the pit between the crowd and they, they don't know nothing. Right, and here come this dude, the little light skinned dude, come out, and all these little girls start screaming. I see my wife and them looking like, "What is, what is going on?" And by the end of the show, <laughs> they love them too. <laughs> I was like, "This is exactly what this is exactly what I think it is. This yeah. shit is finna to go." Right. They didn't let this light nick skin nigga get in. <laughs> looking actually really rap. Come on, he got. He don't have to be gangster because the mob is behind him. Yeah. He being co-signed by the hot, and at the time, Wayne is the hottest rapper. Come on. Literally right. one of the hottest artists in the world yeah. right, at that time. I was, like, it's a, God. I was like, it's all green lights for this fool. But then right. he actually grows into his own man. His own, so yeah. Builds his own team. Mm -hmm. Holds his city down. He, you know, he came in on Wayne's shoulders, and he still gives Wayne the respect that is due to Wayne. But he's by far his own man, his Absolutely. own machine at this point. What goes through your mind when you see the trajectory of his career when you was remembering that humble little call that was put in to Bun to co-sign it? Um, I thank God that I did the verse. <laughs> <laughs> you know, there's a couple of them that got away from me. The one um, over the last couple of years, the one that I regret not getting to, because I try to tell people to stay on me because I get pulled in so many yeah. directions. And people get to thinking they bother me. And then yeah. they stop it. I was supposed to do something with G-Eazy. And I I, mm. I reached out to G-Eazy. I was a fan. I really liked it. You know, the Bay was really fucking with him. Yeah. You know? And he came up the hard way. Him and Macklemore. People don't give Macklemore a lot of credit. The boys were scratching. I watched yeah. him scuffle, right? It's not easy for white boys, you mm -hmm. know? I'm not going to give him no pass or whatever. But I saw them go against the grain for a lot of this shit. And... Jeez was the one that I really hate that I didn't get to, because mm -hmm. I knew that I knew it was I was a, it was a matter of time. Yeah, before it, it, did you ever see him in person, man? Nigga look like James Dean or somebody, <laughs> man. Like he looked like he just walked off from a movie with Elvis Presley or somebody. Yeah, yeah. you know, same thing with MGK. You know, mm. I was with MGK very early. A lot of yeah. people might not know that we did our first show together at the Ruckers, mm. like during the basketball tournament. It's me and MGK on the court, wreck that hoe. Well, see, you might not have caught G-Eazy, but, but you I did catch, catch Jeezy. <laughs> right. Okay, on that trap or die. Well, that a title pivot, big guy, you learned it. <laughs> you learned how to pivot, ain't you? I got it for you, Will. I got it for you. <laughs> that Jeezy trap or die title track for a title project that was going to change the sound in the South 
being a part of that, how the hell did you and Jeezy hook up, and how did that song come about? So I had already done a record with Jeezy called We Getting Money over, over here. Over here. Right? Of course. So that come through my partner, D Money. D Money yeah. is our decatur. He had an artist at the time named Q. We had done some stuff. And he was like, my little partner is trying to rap, man, you know. Why don't you do something with him? So my partner, D Money, connected me and Jeezy. We hit it off um, with the first record, and then that's when he started tapping in with drama and doing a lot of promotion and stuff with drama. And so he reached out to me to do another record. So I go, I meet him at Patchwork. I go in the studio. I lay the verse, you know, chilling, hanging out. I'm like, I go to the bathroom. I walk down the hallway. I see Gucci Mane. Mm. Gucci Mane said, hey, man, I'm, I'm in here. I'm doing my T-shirt, uh, white tee. Uh, black <laughs> tee. Black tea. Black tea. Black yeah. tea remix. Yeah. <laughs> Can you get down on it? I'm like, yeah. And uh, he got on a rose gold chain. I say, man, I've been wanting to get a rose gold chain. Like, where did you get that chain from? He said, I got it from King Johnny in Houston. Like, <laughs> I'm like, well, I'll be goddamn. Yeah. <laughs> rose gold been right there in my face the whole time. I'm just going to the wrong flea market. <laughs> <laughs> but it, it was such a time, right? Like, because Trapper died, Icy, all of this stuff is happening. Um, you know, he, he, he's, we're part of this this BMF movement, Free Big Beach, mm -hmm. at the time. So it's just all this momentum and energy. And Jesus right there on the receiving end of it. Woo. And let me say something. Because we talk about Icy all the time. And much respect to Jeezy and Gucci. But, man, Will made the record. Yeah. Like, Icy was a hit because the hook. Was right. so solid. You know Nobody ever brought that up. And, and you're absolutely right. And if you look at it, Will has more studio experience than them two. Yeah. So Will actually, being from Dungeon Family, yeah. being in that system at the time, was really the, at that point the star of the record. <laughs> right. But we can't see that far now. Yeah. Because there's so much in between then and now. Yeah. But man, it was Will on that. Um, I said, yeah. I, that shit was about the hook. Now, the rappers showed up and looked the part. Yeah. Right? That's a big part of it, too, because they both show up. They both icy. We got Meech and, and the team behind us. Everything looking like it's supposed. Look, and I'm talking about, the, like, they only performed it, like, twice. Yeah. They only did it, like, twice. I was at both of them. Right. You know what I'm saying? Mm. And then Def Jam get in and start trying to figure out who owned the record because they want the record. And then that complicates everything, and it just become a whole they had, they, had, they had the biggest um, uh, versus. Yeah. Uh, I think oh, by I, far. I, right. But I keep telling everybody that will listen to me, I'm screaming from a mountaintop, I feel like UGK and 8-Ball and MJG will, if not pass it, it'll be, be right in the ass. neighborhood. I think it'll be a good one. Now, you got to understand. I think I, it'll be a great one, but A, a lot of people, in terms of versus, right, like the – a lot of people tune in to Jeezy and Gucci Mane for the wrong reason. Right. They tuned uh, in. A lot of people tuned in to see if it was going to go bad. If you looked in the comments, yeah. you know what I'm saying? It was very, it was a lot of suspect shit, suspect shit being said because people expecting, they expecting a fight. That's what people tune in for. Yeah, they, right. really, they really thought something was going to happen that day. Um, but, you know, these, they, you know, look, they showed up. Everybody did what they felt they needed to do, said what they needed to say. And everybody did the Jeezy handled it just like I figured Jeezy would. Yeah. Gucci handled it just like I featured Gucci would. Figured yeah. Gucci would. Both of them walked in as the man they was and walked out the man they was. Yeah. You know, that's that's all you can really say about that. Now, the UGK and A Ball and MG would be very entertaining, right? But versus is a little different now that we back outside. We're right? All, versus everything. was really versus the only reason versus well, I ain't gonna say the only reason, um, because it was a great idea. But the reason that Versus took off in the way that it did was because it was it was specifically targeting our demographic, right? And it wasn't about charting artists or who had the hot record or whatever. It was about creating, like, a vibe. Yeah. Like, putting, man, this, man, we finna see this thing and that. Oh, man, this yeah. finna be live. And I think UGK and A-Ball and MJG would have worked under those circumstances. Now, obviously, the fans still want to see it, and we're ready to do it if called on, but it's a little different now. Like, Versus is not, I mean, it's, it's, it's you know, it's owned by Triller now. Yeah. Triller have oh. different demands that they want on their investment, which is fine. They spend that money they should, you know? And like I say, we'll do it if they ask for it, but 
it's still going to be a little different than if it would have been while everybody well, was inside. Inside. But inside see, versus was a whole different thing. Because you could actually, people's getting dressed up at home and making yeah. drinks at home, <laughs> right. right? And getting ready to party at home. Like, my wife would put on everything but the heels. <laughs> <laughs> but, Bun, I think they'll do it again for UGK and 8 Ball. The I, I, reason I, it's being, still on the table. Because, see, my thing is this. It was like what you were saying earlier with the South. It's a solid majority. You see what I'm saying? That's a big-ass demographic of people that's waiting on that oh, shit. Oh, yeah, without, without question. Oh, you it's going to do saying? numbers. It would definitely do numbers. My God. And, and the energy would be right. Exactly. Right? Because... Like these are my brothers. They're not friends. We are brothers. We, you know, we used to all live like two blocks away from each other. Mm -hmm. You know, making music, smoking weed, hanging out. Like on the, like every other day, we see each other all the time. I've known them for many years. I don't have any. I can't even act like me and Bala G would have like <laughs> be for anything. Right. It's, the, it's not even the right energy for the room. I'm Absolutely. not known for that yeah. energy. Ball and G not known for that energy. Ain't gonna be like, oh, I'm gonna bust your ass with this one. We can't even do it. Like yeah. the New York people do it because that's how New York people talk to each yeah. other. Mm -hmm. They talk funk at each other. First time I seen it, I was like, man. <laughs> right. <laughs> Y'all need <laughs> Y'all must be real good friends the way y'all talk to But it's just it's it's par for the course. But we ready, we on deck. But we then, gave them our songs. Like they got the list, they know what it is, they approved it. But then <clears throat> Dion um not Dion Warwick, the um Patty LaBelle and Gladys Knight happened. Mm. And so that kind of pushed back. And then the Osley brothers and Earth Wind and Fire happened was, yeah. and pushed back. So we were like on this schedule yeah. at a time. Um, and then it just, but these big, and I'm like, look, I want to see the Osley brothers in it. Earth Wind and Fire too, run it, you know? Yeah. But, um, and again, it was like, because it was no money, it was really just for the culture. Yeah, well, at the we time. See so it. we want to. So see I wasn't it. tripping, nobody cutting the lines. Not like somebody got to the bag before me. You know, right. Bun and Eight Ball and MJG Street Niggas, Bad Boy South. When y'all got together and put that record together, what was that like, Bun? That was interesting times because um, Bad Boy wanted UGK at the same time. So My God. Pimp was locked up. I remember Puff had this big party in Houston, and we went to the party, and we went to Puff section like that, and behind all the rope and whatever, and they let me and my wife over, and you know we sat down. And Puff said. Um, with all due respect, B, I need to talk to the wife because I know the wife is the boss. <laughs> and <clears throat> he told her he wanted to sign UGK. He says, I'm going to give your husband this much money. Ooh. I'm going to give his brother this much money. Ooh. When his brother comes home, they're going to be bad boy. We're going to do this. And my wife got in the car and was like, so when are we going to New York? And I'm like, <laughs> I'm like we're not. Ooh. And... That was a very contentious point because she didn't understand why I would turn down the amount of money that they were offering. I said, we didn't come this far to sell this. We got to ride this out. Yeah. You know, I can't have him come home and he work for somebody else now. Right. It's, yeah. it's just not going to work. We got to ride this thing out. I believe that it could be as good, if not better, when he comes home as long as we make sure people don't forget about him. Right. You know, that was my whole thing. We cannot let people forget about him and how great of a talent he is. Because I'm knowing that the level of talent that he possessed does not go away. You know, and, like, we didn't do I, we didn't do a lot of letters. Pimp actually would have access to a phone. And Pimp would, every now and then, Pimp would call me. Yeah. Right? And talk about different albums and different songs. And, like, hey, man, I just, I came up with this. And, like, he's literally in his mind coming up with beats and trying to find ways of remembering different mm. songs in his head till he can come home. Yeah. You know, but I remember the one thing he kept talking about was the Project Pat album. He was always talking about that Project Pat album is so jamming. That bitch so jamming. Boy. Like, and he come home and Project Pat had I Choose You. Thanks. Uh. And he called Paul and Juice and said, hey man, I want to rap to that. I want to rap to that record. Because him and Paul <laughs> and Juice were really, really good friends because he loved LA. They were both on the West Coast at the time. They spent a lot of time together. And we were, you know, we all were good friends and so we were going to do the Underground Mafia album yeah. at the time, right? So Pimp comes home, he said, hey man, that, that I Choose You, man, that's a hit record, man. Y'all need to drop that record again. People didn't hear that record. <laughs> and they're like, Pimp, what you talking about, man? That was, I was like, a year and a half. That's almost two years, man. Pat got another album. We yeah. No, man. Y'all need to redrop that album. 
That's a hit record, man. People need to hear that record. Like, Pimp, we can't, we're not finna redrop the album. Well, man, let me rap to it. Mm. Like, what you mean? Like, let me rap to that beat. Just, Pimp, we got a million beats, my nigga. We can make, I want to rap to that <laughs> beat right there. That's a hit record. <laughs> Give me that beat. That man sent us the session, International Players album. Wow. When y'all linked up with Cass and you got the track from 3-6, man, that was like an all-star, you know, Voltron situation right there. Well, it happened. That's that's God, right? So yeah. the original player's anthem is UGK and 3-6 Mafia. Mm. It was already recorded, done, album turned in. Jai puts out a sampler, right? This is for a lot of y'all youngs, y'all might not know. I would turn, let's say, for example, I'm a recording artist. It's 2005, right? I turn my album in in March. My album not going to come out till November. Mm. Right. Right? But they going to take a couple of cuts from my album, put it on the CD as a teaser for people to hear, and hand it out all summer to get right. the buzz going. So for us, they handed it out in March. They, mm. they put the, the sample out in March. It was All-Star Weekend in L.A. Right? So everybody's in L.A. thought it would be a good place to pass the sample out. Big Boy and Andre both get the, the sampler separately. Both of them reach out to me separately. separately. <laughs> Big Boy says, I love this record. Um, can, I, can I produce some drums? I want to do a drum pattern right. on it. Like, okay, cool. Andre's like, I love it. I love everything but the drums. Can I just rap over the sound? <laughs> I'm like, okay. So that's why you hear Andre verse over the sound over just the loop right. and then Big Boy come in just over the drum. A lot of Big Boy verses just him over the drums. Right. They both submit their verses separately not knowing the other one <laughs> has done the verse unless they talk to each other but at the time yeah. the way it was sent to me like he, he neither one of them told me they had talked to, to the other one and heard yeah. the verse. Right. Now Jive um, <clears throat> Jive is distributed by Arista and Sony at the time and Outkast are signed. So technically, I don't even have to clear it because mm, right. we all under the same label. Yeah, right. All I got to do is convince the group to both be a part of it. So Big Boy's like, absolutely not a problem. Call Dre. I do it, but we ain't doing no video. <laughs> that, was the, he, that was the whole thing. I got no problem doing the record, being on the song. We're not doing no video. <laughs> so we turn the record in, and that's all the record company can think about. How do we get this video Done. And so I said, hire Brian Barber. Hire Brian Barber. That's their director. That's the guy that helps them execute all their visions. Hire Brian Barber. Tell Brian to tell Dre, you can do whatever kind of video he want. You tell us what this video going to be and we going to show up. And so that's what he wanted to do, which is basically what his verse is. A wedding that, that his partner them is trying to talk him out of. My uh, God. So we figure out that the way to get everybody together at the same time is, is BET Award weekend. Mm. So we shoot it in. Now, while all this is happening, again, the original version of this is us at 3-6 Mafia. 3-6 Mafia wins the Oscar, <laughs> the Academy Award right. for hard out here. They go to their record company to renegotiate their contract. We Oscar winners now. We need a different deal, right? right? Yeah. They didn't want to do it. So they stopped them. They stopped clearing their verses. But they didn't have their production deal. <laughs> so hard. we were able to keep yeah. the beat and have the beat get cleared, but we had to take them off the record. Same time, Outkast ends up on the record. And that's, that's the player's anthem you hear. But there is a version of this record with all three groups on it. So there's a version of Players Anthem with UGK, Outkast, and 3-6 Mafia all on the same record. Wow. That's crazy. Wow. And there's a, talk about hitting records. Like his, three, his three favorites. Here's, here's yeah. something you don't know. There's a UGK Dirty South remix that never came out. Oh! 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 We got oh! the oh! You know we got to hear it. You got to we, call Rico to get it. Rico! Rico! Don't know because Rico. we will... So they... They asked for a remix, right? Um, I did, we, UGK did when we went to the house, went to the, the big house, the, uh, the house they got from Curtis, laid a verse, but then Juvenile, I'm not Juvenile, Mystical had done one too. Mystical was a bigger priority 
at Jive. So they cleared him. They wouldn't clear us. <clears throat> so oh. the Dirty South remix has Mystical on it and not UGK. And somewhere, somewhere. <laughs> when you got on that remix, bud, how hard did John Boy snap on that thing, man? We didn't even pull up the beat. I snapped. <laughs> I snapped on there, but that wasn't the one. Okay, that wasn't the one. Okay. Like that was that was a good record, and I'm you know we I did my thing on it, but tough guy. Mm. That's the real. That's the first like UGK Outcast record. Yeah. Nobody really talks about it because it was on the Shaft soundtrack. Yeah, we never did a video or anything for it, but that's the one. Because I had to lay that verse in Stankonia. Ooh. So I'm going in their house. Uh. <laughs> so I'm like, I got to give it all I got <laughs> on this one. And I, I beat I beat up some bars on that bitch. <laughs> <laughs> but I mean, like, it's, it's it's only so much you could do with Dre. Yeah. It's really only so much you could do with Dre. He is probably, I don't think anybody does this as easy mm. as Dre. Right, I don't think anybody is as comfortable with writing as he is. Right, he's just kind of done with performing, mm -hmm. you know. But I mean, Andre Three Thousand is one of the best people to ever decide he wants to write a rhyme. He's one of our greatest entertainers, period. Yeah. But just the fact that that he, you know, he stuck with it for so long because it was it's too easy. Yeah. Like rapping for Dre is is actually it's really too easy mm. for him. And if you notice, he, he finds these other different ways to challenge himself because what everybody wants from him is not really a challenge. Yeah. Wow. You know? And it's I not mean. necessary. It's not necessary for him. He's been blessed enough to have a career that affords him the opportunity to just walk around and play the flute for a year if he want to. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> but he's doing exactly what he want to do. Come on now. Without taking anybody's opinion, thoughts, or into give a fuck. Can't blame him. You rich enough to do that, man? You tell me so. Bun, we talking <laughs> about right nigga? Please you walk around downtown. No, but I ain't got nothing but two pennies to buy. I'm trying to figure out <laughs> ramen noodles, beef jerky, and spam, nigga. But uh, <laughs> that's too fun. Uh, big pimp and bun. When y'all hooked up with Jay Z, when y'all got that call from the NY, what was that like? When you heard, when you first heard that track, how did that make you feel? And then doing that collaboration with Jay-Z, what frame of mind was you at when it was time for Big Pimpin'? When we got the call for that, and we had gotten the call before because <clears throat> they wanted Pimp to be on just a week ago with Too Short. Mm. But this was right in the middle of the East Coast, West Coast beef. And Pimp had just built his, his new studio out in his house in Mableton. He was living here. Told you. And told Hov, you come on down. And we'll do the record. Come to the house, we'll do the record. I was like, well, I ain't leaving the East Coast right now. They were mm. like, well, I ain't leaving the South, so I guess it ain't going to happen. <laughs> and, it, and it just didn't happen. But it, it did come back around to us. And for me, like, I don't know I don't know nothing about the song. All I know is Jay-Z want me to rap on a record with him. So I'm finna bring my the best bars I got to the table. That's all I'm concerned about. And then so I don't hear the record till I actually get to New York and go in the studio. And... It's, it's different, right? right? But not different enough. Because mm. I went in there and beat that bitch up. <laughs> <laughs> and it was literally like we in the room, and, you know, they cut on the beat, and I hear it. And they got a totally different hook. Mm. Like, they didn't have the hook. I put the hook on the record. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> they had another hook. And he was like, everybody's going to do their own hook. So I did my verse, and that was my hook. Mm. And ended up using it for the whole oh, record. For the whole record. Yeah, and so I, I did my, my verse and my hook. Hove left out for about 15 minutes, 20 minutes. Came back, and it was like, you got something? And Guru looked like, nigga, he done. <laughs> and we just sitting in there talking, you know? And he was like, shit, let me hear it. And he, he heard it, like, damn, he kind of went off. And then, <laughs> and then we go through about two and a half months of trying to convince Pimp to get on the record. Yeah. He finally decides to do it. He's like, I'm only giving y'all eight balls. I'm not doing no bunch of it. Because I had already done, like, I think a 32. Right. You know, I, I went, like, maybe a 24. But I went in on that hole, right? <clears throat> He's like, I'm going to give it, I'm giving y'all eight balls. Damn. And it ended up being eight of the most iconic balls ever in history. If you've ever been in a room 
when Big Pimpin' comes on and they get to Pimp Part, yeah, it's like world karaoke. I done been, <laughs> no, I'm serious, because I done been to countries that English ain't the third language they speak, mm -hmm. right? A lot of people, they don't even speak English. Yeah. And they say that phonetically. They just singing along with it. I've never been in a room where I perform that in any country, any city, anywhere. I just put the mic down at that point. Smoking, I pouring up. <laughs> oh my God, you know, wood. In my hood, they call it ball. <laughs> all that brawls at the ball, nigga. <laughs> see, and, and see, that's the genius of him. He tried to be the least involved on the record and became the most important part <laughs> of the record. Wow. Shooting the video though, Bun. What was that like? So. The video is two parts. Mm -hmm. With there's Trinidad and Tobago, yeah, which is the original setup for the videos. Like, so they come, they call us, right? So the original single was the Mariah Rec Mar Mariah record. He had a record with Mariah Carey, mm -hmm. and that was the first single they thought that was gonna blow up, and it, it bricked. It didn't do nothing. Mm. So they called, you know, first called like, yeah, we like the song. We'll probably drop it in the summer. You know, be a good summer record. Then next call, yeah, we think we're gonna probably move it up a little bit. You know, it might come a little soon. Next call, yeah, it's gonna be the next single. <laughs> you know, next call, yeah, we, we just got a million dollar budget, and we're gonna shoot it in in Trinidad and Tobago during Carnival. <laughs> <laughs> just all this shit keep going, <clears throat> and I'm like, all right, let's do it. And Pimp like, I'm not going no motherfucking. Trinidad, <laughs> shoot a <little> goddamn video. Because <laughs> he had just bought a new car. He had a new lady friend at the time, and <clears throat> he didn't. He felt he didn't want to leave the situation to go to go do the video. Right. Well, lady friend is actually one of the people that's supposed to be in the video. <laughs> <laughs> so they looking for him. They looking for her. <laughs> and I'm the only one know they together. <laughs> so they never get him on the plane. They end up doing a reshoot. It's like, well, where is he? Like, he's in Miami. All right, well, we'll let's go to Miami. Get this goddamn video shot. We go to Miami. MTV comes on the set. It's the first rap video on making the video, like the first time. Yeah. And we shoot everything that day. Uh, he shows up, and so you see the, the bands. You see him. The Benz and the girl, that's how he showed up. <laughs> showed up in the Benz <laughs> with, with the girl. <laughs> they get dressed, they come out with mink coats. And it's literally, we're on the beach in Miami. It's about 90 degrees outside. It's, <laughs> they're like, Pimp, you really going to wear this mink coat? Like, Jay-Z's like, you, you, you go. my nigga, you know it's hot out here. Pimp, look, <laughs> Pimp looked at him and said, man, TV ain't got no temperature. Come on uh, now. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> and walked off. <laughs> And Jay-Z looked at me and was like, your brother's a motherfucking star. <laughs> like, that's, all, that's the only way they ever spoke about Pimp. Because he never jumped mm. when they called. He never just jumped. Like, if I'm busy, I'm busy, my nigga. Yeah. If you busy, I'm busy, too. So, what it is. They couldn't do nothing but respect it. And then when he showed, and see, I'm a, I'm a very reserved person. Right. So I make a lot of money, but I don't necessarily look like a lot of money. Yeah. My money look better on my wife. And, Come and my on. Wife. So, that's, that's typically where my I'm money goes. So I show up, you know, very casual. You know, I ain't, I ain't got no bunch of jewelry and shit on. Right. And Pimp show up with the chain and the watch <laughs> and, right. and the bank on. Right, so they thinking Pimp finna show up like me. Pimp showed up like Pimp. Pimp right. <laughs> they looking at Pimp, looking at me like, <laughs> something ain't right. <laughs> and Pimp like, nah, man, Bumpy don't spend his money on that shit, man. He don't spend his money on that dumb shit. I was like, oh, okay. Was like, oh, so you niggas thought we was broke. <laughs> <laughs> oh, oh! Oh, because he ain't got there yet, right? Okay. And I'm wearing beer, and I'm wearing regular shit. I'm wearing regular shit. Oh. Nothing about me screams pay, right? Like, you know, right? That's what he does. Same thing. No, I don't do that because I ain't got shit with <laughs> But uh, <laughs> Jay Prince, what role did he play in y'all career? Mentor. Mm -hmm. Mentor for sure. Um, wanted to sign us. We was already signed. He was cool with that, but always let it be known that his door was open if we needed anything. Mm -hmm. 
And it was always just about advice because we left the first situation, went in the second situation, which was best, worse than the first situation, then went in the third situation, which was us trying to fix it ourselves, and then that didn't work well either. So, you know, but every time we couldn't figure it out, we call old man, and old man to come in and try to do the best thing he could do. You know, he, he did have leverage in the industry, and we were able to use that to our advantage, mm -hmm. you know. Um, definitely would not have made it this far as an artist, right? I'd probably still be making records for somebody else right now. You know, still be tied into somebody's contract. I probably still wouldn't have ownership of all my publishing right now. All of these things because j Press stepped in and said, that ain't right, mm. right? Didn't make a dime off of any of the UGK stuff, right? Um, you know, we never paid him a consultant's fee, none of that type of shit. Just wanted to make sure we didn't get fucked over, mm -hmm. wow. you know? And um, eventually, when Pimp got locked up, um, Pimp was already talking to him about doing some solo stuff when Pimp got locked up. And so I was like, well, the only way I can keep this going is if I do a solo album. So I went to Jive and said, I want to do a solo album. They're like, nah, we good. Mm. Like, Pimp was the star. He made the music. Pimp's the guy. You just the sidekick. I was like, all right, cool. Can I do it somewhere else? They're like, well, where else you going to do it? So I'm going to go to Rap Live with Jay Prince. Mm, I don't know about that. So then they had to kind of go back and forth because they mm. like it. J. Prince not going to make no effort to not make do something that's not going to make some money. Make some money. Absolutely. So it's like, well, what do he know that we don't? <laughs> right? That, yeah. was, that was the thing. What do he know that we don't? Apparently a lot, motherfucker. <laughs> Apparently a whole lot. I'm I went to Asylum Records. Nobody on Asylum Records to the day, and they still signing artists. Nobody sold more records than me mm. at Asylum. Wow. And I still got the highest selling album on Asylum Records. When that man came home, the first thing they did, we sat in the, sat in the, in the Ritz car, and they came to Houston. We all sat down in the suite. And man came down, looked at us, and said, man, I'm sorry. Mm. I apologize. I had no idea. Because everything we told him was, was going to be popular became popular. Right. Right? Wow. And if, maybe if he had listened, we might not have even had to go through those four years. Shit could have went a lot differently. Everybody could have made a lot more money. My but, God. They brought the bag to the Risk Carlton. We signed off on the last two albums for the for the deal, which was a blessing in itself because when he passed away, we were in the middle of doing the next album anyway. We had music done already. And he didn't have to the state got the money very easily because the contract was already signed off. Mm -hmm. You know, so it made that part of what the family was dealing with easier. But um I mean we came out and I'm like shit. First record we made was Here We Go Again. It was a record with Ronald Isley, you know? Yeah. And But now Switches, Switches and Doge was probably one of the last records we were doing at that time in that run of music that we were doing. And he was like, this, well, this is it. This is where it's going. Mm -hmm. And never got a chance to fulfill it. And there's only other one person who could do it. And it's just it's not, it's like I said, he's, he's still, Steve Below is still one of the coldest producers right now. Could crush niggas right now. and But it's not fun for him. It's not... It's not fun like it was. We was doing something special at that time. That it's, it's, and I still make music, you know, I, I still enjoy it. Young artists working with people, you know, Crit was the one that really brought me back. Cause I, I didn't want to do it no more. Yeah. Wow. You know, and my wife was like, well, you got to do it. I was like, well, who am I gonna do it with? She's like, well, you got to do it with one of your friends. You yeah. got friends that make beats. So Crit was the first one I called. Crit was like, yes, absolutely. Come to Atlanta. We sat down, we did. I probably still got 12, 13 records with Crit. We ain't even put out. Like, tough shit, too. See that? Like, tough shit. Them records like four, five years old now. I dropped that bitch tomorrow. You wouldn't even know. Like, tough records. But I just been locking in with Big Crit. So, it was like, okay, doing that with do Big Crit. We got to lock in. We can't be hopping all over the place. So, I went from there. I locked in. I got an album with Manny. Mm -hmm. I went over to Zaytoven. I did an album with Zaytoven. Mm -hmm. Went over to Corey Moe. Got an album with Corey Moe. You know what I'm saying? So I'm sitting on like three, four different albums right now. My God. But COVID kind of threw a lot of, because uh, you know, the Manny one was what was coming first. Mm -hmm. And COVID kind of threw that off a lot. And then at that point, I just start having people send me music and just start locking in with different people. Mm -hmm. And so we're sitting on probably right now, we're sitting on about 60, 70 songs right now. Wow. And five of them, with, with majority of them, 
connected with five projects and then one of them just a lot of stuff that me and Crick me and Crick talk I mean we still got a lot of music like a lot of music there's an album mm -hmm. just sitting over there with me and Crick and Prit, and the other thing is that's why I like Crick Crick was like Chad Crick was like I could do all of this but I'm a Bun B fan I want to hear you rap to certain niggas shit that's right. how the song with Swiss Beats comes up on the mm. album. That's how the song with Akon yeah. comes up on the UGK album. That's how the Molly Mall record comes up. You know what I'm saying? Because um, those are two people like Big Daddy Kane and Coogee Rap is who me and Chad, like, you know, took cues from. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? Like, Chad was that player, mm -hmm. smooth motherfucker, but don't play with him, don't disrespect him. He's, you know, I'm really here to make some money and fuck with some women. Yeah. But don't play with me. Like, don't, just, just don't play with me because it's going to go there. And I'm cool G Rev. I'm just like, fuck all you niggas off top <laughs> until I decide somebody going to be my friend. Well, yeah. I'm, 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 look, I'm, I'm a peaceful person and I'm easy to get along with. Right. But I don't bother nobody. I don't, I've never been a problem. I don't owe nobody no money, no lyrics, no verse, no none of that type of shit. I don't owe nobody nothing. And I move very peacefully. So that when people bother me, I, I, I tend to overdo it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. I feel yeah. that. Because I know I didn't do nothing to deserve how you coming yeah, at me. Coming yeah. At you. But you obviously looking for something. So I'm going to give you what you looking for. everything that you're looking for. Yeah. That's and, what I was telling him, boy. And a six-pack to go. <laughs> That's what I was telling him. He closed. He bought this. Right bought okay. This Let me get back in here. Uh, <laughs> when you looked up. And Pimp got out of jail. What was that like when y'all reunited and it was time for y'all to mash the gas again after you done did the free Pimp C campaign? The man wanted to go to the studio from the jailhouse. We picked the man up and I gave him a phone. That was the first thing. I gave him a phone and it was a razor. He was like, God damn, phone was this small? Nah, <laughs> right. So if you look in all the UGK videos, when he came home, like, get thrown out, he got that raise. He loved that phone. It was perfect. It was right. perfect for what he wanted to do. But the man wanted to go straight to the studio because he had all this music inside that he, he was trying to get out. Like, man, go home. Take you a good bath. Eat you some good food. We'll go tomorrow. <laughs> right. You know? Um, and we, we gave it two days. And then we went in, and that's literally... Here We Go Again is the first record we did. And we had this big budget. And we was like, and this was when Ronald Isley was getting bothered by the IRS. Mm, right. So we was like, man, let's put Ronald Isley, let's, let's not, because we had a guy, Ronnie, Ronnie Spencer, from Houston who sang on One Day, mm -hmm. who sounds just like Ronald Isley. Right. right? right God. We was like, man, let's, let's go get Ronald Isley. <laughs> let's give him some money. Yeah. Right? Because right. he got the IRS on his back. Let's break bread with this man because our whole career is built off of their first, off of Summer Breeze. Yeah. Right. You know? And so that was the first thing we could have had a big budget. It was like, we finna cut around our eyes for $70,000. let us give him that check. Let's give him that bread. And they was like, no, no, he don't cost that much. We was like, okay, we wanna give. But they wouldn't let us pay him what he, you know, he only charged, like, it was 50. You yeah. Know? Right. We wanted to give him like 75. Like, we wanted to give him some money. Right. Yeah. You know? And we, you know, he called us and he thanked us, you know, you know, he was really nice. And then after that, it was Charlie. It was Uncle Charlie. <laughs> Uncle Charlie. So we're in L.A. making records. And somehow Chad meets Charlie Wilson. Now, this is not the resurgence of Charlie Wilson. This is Charlie Wilson, superstar, megastar singer, ends up with a cocaine crack addiction loses his way, right? right? We meet him, he's born again Christian, mm -hmm. just got married to a Christian woman, she's doing well for herself, she got Charlie back on his feet, but Charlie never lost his voice. Mm. And so, this is that era where he's doing a lot of music with Snoop. Right. right? He's living in LA, Yeah. right? He's living in LA, he's trying to get back into it, Snoop them take him, put him right back in the position, and Charlie's on Jive, he's on our record, he's on our, mm. our record company as right. well at the time. They become friends, and Charlie's on two records, I think, if I'm not mistaken. Charlie's mm -hmm. on two different records. But just that bond that mm -hmm. him and Chad was able to create in the studio, I just look at it, I was like, man, it was, I could only imagine the music that, you know, people ask mm -hmm. me, what do I think UGK? I'm, I'm more concerned where he was going. He was the yeah. real visionary. 
And I knew him and Charlie Murphy. Um, I keep saying Charlie Murphy. Yeah. <laughs> Rest in yeah. peace. But I knew him and Charlie Wilson was going to make yeah. some incredible music. Because what Charlie did for us is so heartfelt. It's like the deepest records that we have. Like the realest yeah. shit right. that we have is Uncle yeah. Charlie singing on there. And, you know, just to be able to give back to people that gave so much to us, you know, it was a blessing. We ended up sampling a Maze record. Got to break Maze off a check. Mm. Maze was, I'm, look, I'm a black man from the South. Yeah. Maze, man. Thanks. Like, just Maze. Wow. If barbecues, you know, receptions, yep. repass. I don't care what's going on, man. I'm black, man. Maze, man. Mama yep. cleaning up Sunday morning. Right. Maze, man. Right. Outside, Thanks. washing the car with my daddy. Maze, Thanks. man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. And so just to be able to, to break bread with people that, you know, I like, again, I travel all over the world, man. I got to do a lot of shit, man, because these people didn't say no. I remember we sampled Bill Withers. Bill Withers wasn't really clearing music at the time. Mm. When we sampled Use Me Up, Bill Withers say, I'm a clear, but let me talk to them. Mm. He called and gave us some game. He said, y'all signed to this label. Y'all signed to this man. This man's uncle is this guy. The uncle stole all my publishing. You don't got your publishing, do you? <laughs> I said, no, we don't. Exactly. So that man broke down publishing. He said, do everything you can. I don't care what happens. Save your money and get your publishing back. By the grace of God, we ended up making enough money to get all our publishing back before that man passed away. So there's all these different people that looked out for us. So naturally, we look out for the next generation of people. Pimp did it with producers, yep. people like Corey Moe, who's Corey a Moe. legend in his own right right That's now. That's right. You know what I'm saying? I don't know if people realize how much time Corey Moe sat just sitting there with Pimp. Pimp came home from prison. It was exclusively recording with Corey Moe. Right, if he wasn't in L.A. in the big studio, he had Corey Moe, mm. day for day, making records that never came out. Corey Moe still got music with Pimp C that he'll never release out of loyalty and respect to that man. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. So, just saying all that to say, man, you know we we do have a blessed history. We do have a legacy of our own, but it's only because we made sure to look back and honor the people that created the lane for us. And then also look forward and make sure we was creating a lane for the next generation. Wow, that's deep. When you speak of the next generation, I got to go to Candy Paint with Kodak Black. Yes. Another banger, man. I mean, each generation you <laughs> managed to come in there and co-sign somebody's ass, and this time it was Kodak Black. What was it that made you say, okay, I can jam with Kodak? I actually liked his energy. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? People can't, can't look, he way from, he's raised how he was raised. He is who he is. You either going to accept it or not. I don't knock people for who they are. Yeah. I get mad when people try to be who they not. Yeah. I got a problem with that. But if you are who you are, you comfortable with that? If you like it, I love it, my nigga, because I don't yeah. have to go home with you. <laughs> I, don't, with I don't live with it. Yeah. You know. But I did like Kodak energy. And sometimes I hope that when I can talk to some of these cats, I can try to give them some game. I didn't get to build that relationship with because the man only called me at 3 o'clock in the morning. <laughs> the man would only call at three o'clock in the morning. I wake up the next day, like, who the fuck is this calling me? Yes. And my young partner right here, GP, <laughs> GP from four five, another young young artist I'm working with from PA. Yeah, but and so Fat Boy who used to be with Khaled, um, that's who called me because he was working with him. And Fat Boy was like, I'm telling you, but I, I, he's like, it's, a lot of people want to work because he was hot. A lot mm -hmm. of people want to work. He's like, I need him to work with you. I need him to talk to you. I need people to see. <clears throat> that you're the kind of OGs that he's connecting with that's exactly. going to say a lot for the young cat, you know? And I've been like that. I remember having to stand up for Soldier Boy. People used to give Soldier Boy all the <laughs> grief in the world. I say, man, look, when when New York had UMCs and y'all was doing blue cheese, we let y'all do that. Exactly. We, you know, we ain't not, we didn't, look, if that's who y'all like, you know, y'all got a problem with Soldier Boy, but we can do chicken noodle soup, right? With, with the, the soda on the side. side. Right. It, Kids dance, man. Kids dance. That's what they do. Right. And on. kids' music ain't for grown folk. So if you're sitting around judging, which he was a kid at the time, if you're sitting around judging, cheering, man, you got too much free time. Right. You worrying about other people cheering. What the fuck is your cheering? Come right. on. What is you doing? Right. And I just didn't like everybody piling on. And they was just mad because he was making money. I, the only thing I could come mm. to, only conclusion I could come to was that it was making too much money. Right, because he was the first one with the internet. He beat the ringtones up. That man made millions of dollars with that rubber band necklace on his neck. And <laughs> niggas couldn't stand it. They couldn't stand it. That's all it was, man. They was mad because they, and to this day, 
that's still the only problem that they have with Soldier Boy. How is he rich? Mm. How is it that he got rich and they feel he's less talented than they are? Hustle, nigga. Yeah. Hustle. Come on. For you, Bun, when y'all started to see the money, what was what did that do for you? Did it change you in it, or was it was like, it's about damn time we got paid for this shit we've been doing? I just wanted to make sure we were safe when we moved around, because we started going different markets. Mm. Like, in the South, I, don't, I, I wasn't really concerned, only until a certain level, because we knew everybody everywhere, yeah. right? So we were connected with those niggas. So if I'm good in New Orleans, I'm with... I'm with some of the worst niggas in New Orleans. <laughs> exactly. So I'm not really concerned. Same yeah. thing in Baton Rouge, yeah. same thing in Atlanta. Wherever yeah. we go, we with them niggas. Yeah. So I'm not worried about if them niggas deciding to come to the show. Oh, they coming. They coming yeah. with me. Exactly. So right. it's not a big deal. But then we started going into Chicago mm-hmm. and into Detroit and Philadelphia, right? Where we didn't necessarily have those ties. But real recognized real. I go to Chicago and like, yeah, you so you down with that's my partner, so yeah. and so. And I went to college with so and so. And yeah, like, yeah, he played for y'all. He played for the for the Rockets, but he from here. Like, we right. started. It's, it's family ties everywhere. Absolutely, like, say that. It's family ties everywhere. And so, that was it. That's all we needed to know. To know was that we knew niggas. Yeah. So I'm I'm finna carry it like I carried it anywhere else. Thanks. You know, but it it was nice, man. To to, to for this thing to really blow up and spread like that and to be accepted in these areas and you know I ain't never had I haven't had nobody in in the East Coast Midwest None of that shit try us you know come on not, we, like, not that niggas was scared yeah uh, but just tough real niggas recognize real, real. Niggas. yeah yeah BMF in Atlanta during that time, being able to peek around in Atlanta, you over there jamming with Jeezy. Obviously, you the underground king, so legendary in the city coming in here. What was that like during that BMF time when stuff was when they were making it rain in the clubs and nobody had ever seen it before? Everybody would talk about the money mm. with BMF. I was always my thing was the loyalty, mm. right? The way they were locked in with each other, right? Because if you look at BMF as a family. These are people from all over the country. Detroit, Philly, New York, Atlanta, Florida, Texas, California. You know what I'm saying? But everybody, nobody was trying to beat for each other. Mm-hmm. Everybody was making money. Everybody was a boss in their own little circle. So when you would see BMF pull up, this is not Meech with a bunch of people hanging around. This is Meech, his captains. Like, everybody is made. Yeah. You know, and, and it was no jealousy. You know, it, like he say, man, we not over here trying to fuck each other's woman. They weren't. Mm-hmm. You don't see that. You don't see that every day. You look at social media, everybody want to fuck the same broad. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Come on. You know, and, and but it was low, and he was so, Meese was trying to start a record company. Me say the music industry, they, they take 85% and they get an artist 15. Mm-hmm. I'm gonna get an artist 85%. And keep 15 because I don't need no money. I'm rich. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Come on. I thought it was brilliant. Yeah. I thought it was brilliant. This is when they put up the billboard. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I thought it was, I said, this is brilliant. I said, they're never going to let this nigga do this. <laughs> Shit. Because I felt like the record company was going to be more gangster than the feds was going to be. <laughs> right. If he actually really got in like that and created stars. Because right. Jeezy had way too much momentum, even though Jeezy wasn't necessarily a BMF artist mm-hmm. right. at that time. Had BMF locked in a distribution deal, I'm almost certain that Jeezy would have been a part of that. Absolutely. I would have been a part of it. Absolutely. You know, when this conversation started happening, that was a place for me yep. in the business structure. And I was, I was down with it. Mm-hmm. You know, and I just, I hated to see... I hated to see it fall apart in the way that it did because I don't know if you'll ever see a team as solid as that again. Mm -hmm. I mean solid. I mean, I don't know. It's hard to compare it to anything, man. You really had to be there to see it, you know, because Meech wanted everybody to enjoy in the way that he did. He wanted everybody to have like he had. We wore the same shirts. We wore the same G, the jerseys, everybody had on jewelry. So you couldn't really even tell who the boss was unless you knew. Yeah. Right? That's how it is in my church. You go to my church, all the deacons <laughs> and the pastor, they all dressed alike. Ain't no big chair at the front. Yeah. So you don't know who the pastor is until he come up and start preaching. Thanks. Right. You know what I'm saying? That just lets you know that's a team. Absolutely. That's a team. You know what I'm saying? It don't matter. 
look, man, I may be I may be the boss, but we all bosses. Thanks. You know, and <clears throat> I hate it. I hated to see it happen like it did. I miss my nigga. He was a good dude. He, he took care of a lot of people, yeah. men, women, families. He did a lot for a lot of people and took his time like a man. And he going to come home like a man. Yeah, you know, and shout out to Lil Meech for, for holding down his legacy, for, you know, walking this movie in the way that he is. Because it's, I mean, this TV show, because it's, no, it's another season. Yeah. It's another season coming. Already. You know what I'm saying? But, man, when, when, when dude come home, man, it's going to be a big day. It's going to be a big day. Between the time that the pimp came home and the time that he passed, what was that time between y'all like when he was back and y'all was able to jam and y'all got this new sound that y'all about to push, but then it comes to an abrupt halt? Well, what happened was it was a lot going on with us at the time. Um, you know, we were going through a lot, trying to get him readjusted, reacclimated, and he came home and there were some things he wanted to do. You know, I had done a, a solo career and I had a solo run and whatever. And now he has a solo career, and he wanted to go and do that. And I had no problem with that. I let him do everything like he wanted to do. And, but it wasn't working like he thought it was working, you know. And he had some people around him that I didn't necessarily agree with. I had people around me he didn't like. We didn't keep the same friends. We didn't keep the same company, so to speak. And we drifted apart a little bit, and I, but I let him live his life. He was making choices that I didn't agree with, but I wasn't finna judge him on it. I wasn't finna make a big deal about it. That's how you want to move right now. I'm going to have to just let you move like that, you know. I don't move like that, and I can't move with you while you choose to move like this. He was making the choices that I didn't agree with, and so I, I couldn't stand by and, and watch certain things happen. And then eventually, you know, he, he called me one night, and we had a conversation. We talked everything through, and he told me he loved me. I told him I loved him, and the man was dead two days later. My God. Wow. Did you, was there anything in your spirit that felt like that could have possibly been coming, or was this a situation to where it totally caught no, off No, not in the sense of him passing away, but there was energy around that I wasn't, I couldn't co-sign. Mm. You know, there was things he was saying, things he was doing. And, I, and look, I, I'm of the philosophy that if me and my brother have issues, like if I'm somewhere, with, let's say I'm with Wicked, and Beehive is my friend, mm -hmm. right? But you don't like Beehive. Right. So you have issues with Beehive, and you and Beehive get into it, right? I'm going to let you and him say y'all words. I'm not going to stop you. I'm not going to. But when we leave, right. if I don't agree with what you did, I'm going to tell you, I'm not going to argue with you in the moment. Yeah. You my friend. You my brother. Yeah. Right. You know what I'm saying? Right. I'm not finna. T I'm not finna not stand with my brother in the moment. I don't care if it's a lie. We got like the like Slim Charles said. Right. We got to stand on that lie. Yeah. That's just how I'm built. Now, once me and you get away, I'm gonna tell you, man, that shit wasn't cool. You tripped out. You know. But whatever issues we had going was never for nobody to deal with. That was never for nobody else. And we dealt with all of that before he died. Now there might be other people who didn't get that closure. Mm. You know, and I pray for them because that's a lot. You know, I have people in my life that died that I didn't get to say goodbye to. Mm. And I still deal with that, you know. But I can rest in the fact that I was able to speak through all of that with that man and make my peace with that. Um, but I still miss him, yeah. you know. And this shit was not. If my wife hadn't told me to start rapping again, I don't know if I would have touched the mic again like that. I might have done a feature here or there, but. I never, I was never a solo artist. Only time I did a solo album because the man was in jail. Yeah, but that was always under the pretense of him coming back. When I knew he wasn't coming back, I didn't want to do it no more. Wow. What was it like when you got back in there and now you dropping these trio albums and the trilogy of these trio albums and working again? How did you get your mojo back? I look at people like Puffy, Jay Z, these people that have gone from rich to wealthy. And you realize that it's not the music, it's the momentum from the music, right? So Jay-Z, for example, Jay-Z decided he wanted to do an album. Jay-Z's not gonna get rich putting out no music, right. but his tour gonna be sponsored by this company. Mm -hmm. He's gonna have this company promoting and marketing. So from an album that may generate 10, 12 million dollars, there's 40, 50 million dollars worth of business 
being done around that album. The album is only done to show you that the people that you want to sell your shit to still fuck with me. Right. Like right. you hear Puffy talking about he want to do another album. For what? There's no reason for Puff to really do another project, right? In terms of artistry. There's nothing. Only thing it is, that's got to be something that's going to facilitate something else. Mm -hmm. right. Now, whether it's that, that's his businesses, mm -hmm. maybe there's producers, writers, or artists that he want to give a push. Mm -hmm. But Puffy doing the album ain't got nothing to do with Puffy as an artist. This is a business. If he does this album, this is to perpetuate business. Absolutely. You know? Absolutely. So that's what I started looking at, man. Like, maybe the end game for me ain't with this music, but this music is going to get me to my end game. So I started looking at the different rooms I was being welcomed in, different people I started seeing. And I'm real good. You can put me in any room. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? I'm going to make a friend. I don't care where you <laughs> drop me off. I'm going to make a friend. I've been lucky to make some real good friends. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Because I ain't scared to go in no room and talk to motherfuckers. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? That's opened up a lot of different shit for me. So now we still do music. I, look, I still love rapping, you know? Concerts, the people make me want to do concerts. I would much prefer being at my house, but people still actually come out, get dressed. Yeah. They got to get babysitters and shit now <laughs> yeah. or right. something like that. But people still make the effort to come see me, so I'm going to still make an effort to be seen. But I I feel like I plateaued in terms of maximum output of music and, 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 and what I'm getting back from the music, right? right? There's only so much the music is gonna get streamed. It's it's you know, but right. but it's a healthy piece and we can live with that right, right now. But if we wanna make big money, we gotta figure out how to take this brand mm -hmm. that sold this mm -hmm. and make it sell that. Right. So that's why we got Trio Burgers. Right. Come on now. You know what I'm saying? I'm just about to ask about yeah. one. Did you bring those one? Man, I, <laughs> did, you, did you if I had one? to bring it all the way from Houston, man, you know. <laughs> <laughs> cold as hell. But I'm gonna bring but I'm gonna I'm gonna bring it to 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 other cities, man. We just wanna get it locked in in Houston. But I'll be honest, man, I wanna bring it to before I come to Atlanta, man, I wanna take it to Macon. Mm. Right. You know, right. I wanna take it to Athens. Yeah. Because them people don't get nothing from nobody. Facts. Nobody go to small town America and bring nothing. If I open up a Trill Burger and Megan George, it's gonna Megan's gonna, gonna come go out. Crazy. They Absolutely. gonna buy the shit out yeah. of that burger. Absolutely. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because now they got something Atlanta ain't got. Come right. on. How many times do these small cities get to say they got something the big city ain't exactly. got? Exactly. Right. We gonna right. let this, we gonna let the small towns eat. That makes sense. And then when, when everybody else is good, like so, we'll hit all around Atlanta. Yeah. And then we'll bring it to Atlanta. Exactly. Right. Right. Makes sense to me. I have to drive down to Macon to give me a damn trail burger. Yeah. Well, well, Red, uh, Red Robin was doing that. Uh, that uh, they didn't bring them. They didn't have them in Atlanta. My God, it's, it's cheaper to, to do, right? It's yeah, yeah. For what it would cost me to find a place to set up trail burgers. I already know. In Atlanta. Yeah. <laughs> sign that five year lease that you got to sign. Come right. on, man. All that, my, that cash commitment, man. I'm about to sell a gang of goddamn burgers over the first know. two years just yep. to make some money back. Right. If I do it in Macon, I can do it for 120th of what it costs me. Come on. Me. In Atlanta. Right. And still say. And people going to buy more because in Atlanta you got way more choices. Yeah. I'm going to be the best thing in town I hit make. Right. You I'm know? here for that. Yeah, me too. You got any more questions with? Uh, no, man. That bun bar hit it all. I, you know, I, I, I still want, got more, but we got shit up, we got to do. We got a whole concert we but, got to but do. But I want to say. Talk to me. I want to say to Wicked, we used to sit back Ooh. and watch Ghetto Mafia. And all we would say was, how did them niggas beat us to that sample? <laughs> y'all ear. Y'all don't get enough credit for y'all ear. Y'all damn sure don't get no credit for y'all hooks. Come on now. Y'all had, not some of, y'all had the coldest hooks out of all of us at that time. Y'all was hitting them right records, transferring that hook from that arm beat. Come on See, now. Y'all niggas are legends. Y'all music is classic, and if don't nobody else tell you, Wicked, you are a motherfucking me legend out here, man. Thank not you, and not not I'm kinda, man, not sorta. Of. <laughs> you know you this nigga, you can't take that nigga that thing. Don't bring me the hot bun, don't bring me the hot bun. Nah, because 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 I was I was out here, man. I was out here watching Ghetto Mafia, yeah. Watching Top Authority, yeah. Watching the Dayton Boys. Come on now, you know what I'm saying. 
I'm with These you. niggas set the tone. We set the tone mm-hmm. for all this shit. That's the only reason niggas feel comfortable representing their little hood now. Cause how y'all got to represent Decatur. Come how on. we got to represent Port Arthur. We made it we made it sound good to be from a small town. Right. Yeah. From a small hood. Right. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So I, I feel it's necessary because y'all spend all y'all time giving everybody else their flowers. My nigga, you deserve your flowers. You and Nino. Yeah. Are legends, my nigga. Y'all, <laughs> history, bro. God, Facts. Damn, I concur with that, Bun. I concur with that. I appreciate it, man. We, <laughs> we close. We, 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 we close right out with that. Man. Man. Like, we close out with that, man. Hey, man, look, I ain't coming to lie to y'all. <laughs> Bun, appreciate you stopping through this thing, boss, man. It mean a much, a lot to me and Wicked in this thing. Yeah, man, it meant a lot to me, too. Already. Be high radio shouty. OG Gangsta Wicked. Bun B, the underground king. Radio shouty. We out of here. Go. <laughs>